Good everyone. Welcome to this public hearing on uh, actually two bills. We're going to combine them into a single uh, public hearing. House Bill 317, uh, prime sponsor is uh, Representative Greg Rothman, which deals with uh, some putting some framework to the automatic license plate reader uh, system that's already in place. And also on House Bill 1509, the prime sponsor is uh, Representative uh, Barry Joswiak, which we've been calling the two-in-one sticker, uh, the, the com combination of a registration sticker and a license, a, uh, an inspection sticker. Um, it's generated, those, those uh, two bills have generated a lot of excitement. It's nice to see so many of our members here uh, taking time from, uh, in the middle of the week from their uh, schedules to be here on these uh, bills. I think it shows the high amount, of, high level my amount of interest in the bills. Uh, and to present, first I'll ask uh, Representative Joswack if you would tell us a little bit, I'm sorry, before we do that, you're right, I would, we have to take a formal roll call. So, Michelle, if you would call. Tennessee. Here. Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, thank you all for being here. Uh, it appears that we are being televised, uh, not to put any additional pressure on you, Barry, but you, you are being recorded here for posterity. What is? Uh, why don't you give us uh, your statements with regard to House Bill 1509, then we'll move to Representative Rothman. Hey, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Hennessy and Chairman Carroll and all of my colleagues on the Transportation Committee. And with me today is Attorney, Attorney Jill Vecchio from our legal staff who helped with the research and draft of this bill. She also will be here to answer any questions with me. HB 1509 is an important bill. It's commonly called the two-in-one sticker bill. The bill incorporates the inspection sticker and the registration into one sticker, which would be placed on the registration plate of the vehicle and eliminate the inspection sticker on the windshield. The process would be the owner of the vehicle would receive a notice from PennDOT advising their registration is due for renewal. This usually occurs within 60 days of the expiration of the registration. The owner would present the vehicle for state inspection. Upon passing the state inspection and verifying the vehicle is insured, the vehicle owner would receive a receipt from the inspection station advising it passed the inspection. The receipt would be sent along with the registration renewal to PennDOT for a registration sticker to be placed on the license plate. In addition, the public may also renew their on their computer or through an online messenger, and these three ways are currently in use today. PennDOT ceased to issue registration renewal stickers as of January 2017. In 2017, 234,000 vehicles did not renew their registrations, resulting in a loss of revenue to PennDOT of $22 million. In 2018, PennDOT lost another $11 million in vehicles not renewing their registrations. This is $33 million in two years. In addition to these vehicles not being registered, there is the issue of vehicles not being insured or inspected. A serious problem for a vehicle owner involved in accidents with uninsured vehicles on the roadways. If your insurance policy covers you for uninsured vehicles, you will only receive the amount you are insured for, not necessarily the value of your vehicle, especially if the vehicle is new. Implementing this two-in-one sticker will ensure all vehicles are properly registered, inspected, and insured and restore the lost revenue to the Commonwealth. This will also return the, the expiration dates of your registration and inspection to the same month, thus providing uniformity for vehicle owners. Currently, these, these uh, expire different months of the year and people just forget to get them done. 
In 2015, the committee and the full House of Representatives passed HB 1154 by a vote of 155 to 36. This bill returned the sticker to the license plate. That was sent to the Senate where it was stopped. It stayed, stayed in the Senate. I have received many calls and emails from people in Pennsylvania advising, advising they are being stopped out of state and receiving citations for not displaying a current registration plate. In one case, I received an email advising a vehicle owner's daughter attending college in Massachusetts and rece received three citations in one day for not displaying a valid plate. That's an extreme hardship for anyone trying to attend a hearing to dispute the citation. I also have received inquiries from many news outlets in Pennsylvania with a positive reaction to this bill. Today, the Pennsylvania State Troopers Association and the Fraternal Order of Police, Pennsylvania State Lodge, are not in attendance today. And I want to explain why they want to be here to tell you their support for this. The National FOP Conference is being held in New Orleans as we speak. And both organizations speak for the law enforcement in Pennsylvania, requiring them to be in attendance. And that's where they're at today. So in your packet, the state FOP submitted some written testimony for you to look at. In addition, I have included in your packet support letters from the State Lodge Fraternal Order of Police, representing 40,000 local police officers, the Pennsylvania State Troopers Association, representing 40, approximately 4,500 state troopers, the Chiefs of Police Association, and the authority, which is the Pennsylvania Auto Theft Prevention Authority, with the board of directors made up of two former state police department commissioners, the chief deputy of the attorney general's office, and three insurance companies. It is very clear the public and law enforcement wants the renewal sticker back on the license plates. Removing the inspection sticker from the windshield of the vehicle allows the police officer to know the vehicle is properly inspected without walking up to the front of the vehicle to visually look at the sticker, possibly putting the officer in harm's way, depending on who's driving the car. There's a number of reasons to have the registration expiration sticker on the license plate. It has, it, by not having it there, it has hindered the performance of law enforcement. The sticker provides a way for police to immediately identify unregistered and uninsured vehicles. It also took away probable cause for law enforcement to stop a vehicle and possibly discover other criminal activity afoot. Drivers having tr are having trouble driving out of state with an expired registration on their vehicle. PennDOT has seen a reduction in the number of registrations since the stickers were taken away. 234,000 registrations in 2017 alone. This will ensure that all vehicles in the Commonwealth are inspected, insured, and registered, and restore lost revenue to the Commonwealth. PennDOT has several multi-million dollar machines just sitting idle and can easily be put back to use to, use to issue registration stickers. PennDOT advised the cost of printing registration stickers was anywhere from $1.2 million to $4.5 million. In the appropriations hearing in March of 2018, PennDOT testified it costs $1.4 million to produce the registration stickers, stating it saves costs. PennDOT lost $33 million in two years. There is no savings. I want to thank the committee for holding this hearing and request support for the bill. I wanted to uh, give all law enforcement the tools that they request and need and also make it easier for the public to have their vehicles registered, inspected, and insured at the, insured at the same time. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you, Barry. Um, and hopefully that positive reaction that you were getting from the press and the public uh, continues after the hearing, <laughs> especially from the members of the committee. Uh, Representative Rothman, if you would like to comment on House Bill 317. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and also Chairman Carroll. And colleagues, thank you for... Um, having this hearing and uh, all being here to learn about automated license plate reader systems. Uh, and let me be clear, there is, there is currently no statewide statute, regulation, or policies in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania regarding the use of L ALPRs or the automated license plate reader system. So this is the first legislation that would put uh, policy, develop policy uh, on the license plate uh, readers. Uh, HB 317 adds Chapter 70 to the Vehicle Code, which would restrict government's use of uh, the automated license plate readers. It also provides for restrictions on the preservation and disclosure of captured data and the destruction of that data, while mandating a usage policy and sets penalties associated with the misuse of uh, the license plate readers. 
Uh, a state, county, or local law enforcement agency may only use, if the legislation becomes law, uh, the license plate readers for legitimate law enforcement purposes, conducting criminal investigations, or ensuring compliance with federal, state, and local laws. A government entity may use uh, the license plate um, readers for controlling access to secured areas. However, before using the license plate readers, individuals shall complete a training course approved by the Pennsylvania State Police and the Municipal Police Officers Education and Training Commission. Um, this is a opportunity for us to address as a commonwealth uh, the technology that is currently being used and to put some safeguards to protect the privacy of our residents while balancing the need for uh, protecting our citizens uh, in criminal investigations, including uh, amber alerts, uh, car thefts, uh, missing children, uh, and uh, the such that would, um, would uh, this would allow law enforcement and help law enforcement in uh, solving crimes. So thank you for your indulgence. Look forward to uh, hearing from our, uh, those testifying today. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Joe, if you'd like to take your uh, seats up here at the table, uh, we'll call the first panel of testifiers. And as they are from the Pennsylvania State Police, Major Douglas Berg, who's the Director of the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and Major James Basinger, uh, Director of the Bureau of Patrol. Okay. Major Burig, are you going to lead off? Yes, sir. Okay. Begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Hennessy, Carol, and the members of the House Transportation Committee. I'm Major Douglas Burig. I'm the Director of the Bureau of Criminal Investigation for the Pennsylvania State Police. With me here today is Major James Basinger, the Director of the Bureau of Patrol for the Pennsylvania State Police. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, testify today about House Bills 317 and 1509 to provide insight about how this will affect operations at PSP. ALPRs have proven to be an extremely effective tool for law enforcement to investigate and resolve a myriad of crimes. Major, could you get a little closer to the microphone, sure. please? Thank you. This technology employs high-speed cameras mounted on police vehicles or fixed locations to capture images of registration plates of passing vehicles and instantaneously transmit them to information held in local, state, and federal databases such as the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, the National Crime Information Center, the Commonwealth Law Enforcement Assistance Network, the National Amber Alert System and the Terrorist Screening Center, among others, then immediately alerts law enforcement to the location so appropriate action can be taken. The historical information contained in ALPR systems is equally invaluable to us to help investigate crimes that are not reported immediately or to further long-term investigations that might span months or years, such as those targeting drug or human trafficking organizations. This important tool serves as a force multiplier for law enforcement. ALPR systems are in use throughout the Commonwealth, but we're not leveraging the full benefits of this technology because the various systems are siloed and they're not interconnected. Currently, a department in Western Pennsylvania may not be aware that a vehicle connected with one of their investigations was captured on an ALPR in Eastern Pennsylvania. Suspects often commit crimes spanning multiple jurisdictions in many counties, further reinforcing the need for a statewide ALPR solution. Law enforcement in Pennsylvania often rely on ALPR data from neighboring states to further their cases. PSP appreciates the importance of maintaining the integrity of citizens' information captured on ALPRs. This legislation helps to ensure the confidentiality of this information by establishing a framework in which ALPRs must be utilized. The provisions of this legislation will include who can use ALPRs, how the data can be accessed, how long the data can be stored, among other things. The bill would also forbid the use of ALPRs for passive surveillance and not allow information gathered from ALPRs to be accessed through the right to know law. The protection of citizens' privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties are paramount in all law enforcement activities, including the use of advanced technology. Although supportive of the use of ALPRs, and House Bill 317, PSP does have some concerns with the current language of the bill, such as funding for local police departments to ensure connectivity with the ALPR systems within PSP, the ability of local police to continue to use the systems they currently have, 
and the funding for PSP's development, maintenance, and storage of the statewide system. All of these concerns can be resolved through collaboration with the General Assembly to produce a bill which will be high, highly beneficial to all involved. The proven benefits of ALPRs in solving crimes and obtaining justice for our citizens far outweigh our concerns with this bill. Enactment of House Bill 317 will be a progressive step towards a uniform system for law enforcement to utilize ALPRs and the associated data collected to assist in solving crimes while at the same time ensuring the confidentiality and security of our citizens' information. Thank you. Thank you. Major, Basing, Major Basinger, is it Basinger? Basinger, yes, sir. Basinger. Any relation to the actress? No, sir. <laughs> okay. She's, I will say she's a little prettier than you are, but wow. you look pretty handsome in that uniform. Thank you. I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. Uh, as stated, I'm Major James Basinger. I'm the director of the Bureau of Patrol for the Pennsylvania State Police. House Bill 1509 is intended to create a two-in-one registration slash inspection sticker affixed to a motor vehicle's registration plate. Act 89 of 2013 eliminated the requirement to display a registration sticker on a registration plate upon initial registration or for renewal. Currently, a vehicle's owner can renew a registration through several avenues, including online, and he or she is still expected to exhibit a current registration card upon request by a police officer. It has been claimed that the elimination of re registration stickers has left law enforcement without a significant tool to identify unregistered or uninsured vehicles. And as such, public safety has been compromised. The Pennsylvania State Police does not feel this is a completely accurate reflection of what we are experiencing. Our patrol vehicles are equipped with mobile office systems which allow troopers to manually enter a registration number and receive an immediate response from PennDOT indicating the status of a vehicle's registration. PSP believes the direct verification through PennDOT systems is a more accurate way to verify a vehicle's registration status. With the previous registration sticker system, we frequently investigated incidents where the old registration stickers were altered or, stro or stolen from one vehicle and placed onto another. In the two years since Act 89 has been in effect, the number of citations issued by Pennsylvania police officers for violations of Title 75-1301A has increased approximately 52%. We feel while some of these violations could be the result of vehicle owners forgetting to renew their vehicle's registration because they no longer have a visual reminder on their license plate, it is more likely due to police officers utilizing the in-car technology more effectively and not relying solely on observing an expired or missing registration sticker. Under the previous system, an officer may have observed a registration which appeared valid when in fact the registration had been in suspended for insurance cancellation. Utilizing the mobile office rather than merely looking for a sticker provides a more accurate and real-time status of a vehicle registration. This bill proposes to eliminate the current system of inspection certificates which are affixed to a motor vehicle's windshield. If one of the reasons for a return of the registration stickers is that Act 89 removed an observatory tool for police officers, could not the same argument be made that eliminating inspection stickers would re also remove an observatory tool? Police officers in Pennsylvania commonly glance over at the windshields of vehicles passing in the opposing direction to ensure an inspection is valid. In addition, there are scenarios in which a vehicle which will, need, will still need to display an inspection certificate instead of the proposed two-in-one sticker. Type D farm vehicles do not need to be registered. However, they, they would be required to display a validating, reg, they would not be required to display a reg, registration sticker, but would still require an inspection sticker. This would necessitate a separate inspection certificate apart from the two-in-one sticker. There are also scenarios where a vehicle would require a registration sticker but not require an inspection certificate, such as trailers 3,000 pounds or less, trailers greater than 17,000 pounds displaying a current federal certificate of inspection, and antique vehicles. Today in Pennsylvania, in order to get one's vehicle inspected, a person must first present proof of, proof of vehicle is insured as well as proof of ownership of the vehicle. 
Proof of ownership is accomplished by providing a valid registration card, certificate of title, or manufacturer's certificate of origin. House Bill 1509 would reverse this process and require a vehicle be inspected prior to initial registration or registration renewal. It would require an agent of PennDOT to verify that a certificate of inspection has been issued, if required by Chapter 47 in Title 75, prior to issuance of a registration renewal or temporary registration. Proof of insurance of a certificate of inspection would be furnished by the owner of the vehicle by presenting a certificate of inspection issued for the vehicle. Currently, the certificate of the inspection is merely a sticker affixed to the windshield of a vehicle. There is no separate documentation that a vehicle's owner would possess in order to be able to provide proof of inspection to PennDOT prior to registration process. If PennDOT must create a new form to document a valid vehicle inspection and provide this new form to a vehicle owner in order for them to complete the registration process, PSP would have concerns that this form could be altered in order to fraudulently register vehicles. Additionally, the old registration stickers were oftentimes altered or stolen from one vehicle and placed onto another. We believe this could also be the case with a proposed two-in-one sticker if affixed to the registration plate on the exterior of the vehicle. House Bill 1509 would create a complete reversal of our current registration and inspection procedures and burden the Commonwealth's vehicle owners by restricting their ability to efficiently renew the registrations online. Although a registration sticker affixed to a vehicle's registration plate can serve as a potential visible tool for law enforcement as well as a reminder to the motoring public to renew their registration, the Pennsylvania State Police believes this change is unnecessary and would not result in an increase in highway safety. To the contrary, there are scenarios in which provisions contained in this bill could lead to fraudulent registration of vehicles or to theft of stickers. It is for these reasons that the Pennsylvania State Police is a, opposed to House Bill 1509. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you with our respective testimony, and we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And thank you, Majors, Majors uh, for your testimony. Uh, Major Basinger, with regard to the mobile office uh, that's in, in uh, troopers' cars now, yeah. does, do you have to, in the, how does it work in terms of, uh, you know, checking through the, sen the computer system whether or not a car is, act is uh, properly registered and has been inspected. Do you have to stop the car first and then manually input the, the license plate number? Is there a, like a one-button system where if you're following behind my car, you can push a button and it would automatically tell you without stopping me that my car has been inspected and it's uh, properly registered? No, the system actually requires an officer to look down, type in the registration, hit enter, and a response will come back on the screen. And we're doing that while you're driving? Yes, or while we're, usually it would be seated in behind a vehicle, maybe at a red light or something like of that nature. Okay. Or on a midnight shift, you have two officers in the car and, and the passenger can run the registration. Okay. Um. With regard to those situations where both inspection and, and a registration is not required, couldn't like antique vehicles is one uh, that you mentioned in a small trailer. Couldn't we uh, deal with that question uh, just by color coding the uh, that particular uh, sticker by saying you know it's this is uh, it's an antique vehicle has an orange sticker as opposed to the standard sticker. Uh, the the small trailer could have a red sticker as opposed. Couldn't we? answer that question and take away most of the confusion just by color coding the, the stickers that PennDOT issues? Yes, you would have to develop a, a different sticker system which would have to be addressed, but yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Whoops. Barry, you want to go first? Go ahead, kick it off. Thank, thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Uh, Major Basinger, on the antique vehicles, aren't they exempt from inspection? Okay, yes. People list here. So you wouldn't need an inspection for that? No. You, you just need an exemption for them and you send it in for your renewal, it already says on the vehicle antique. Just keep Correct. Just so having a special sticker would not be necessary. Well, if you wanted a two-in-one sticker, you would have to separate the registration and the inspection. But I hear you, but if it's exempt, it doesn't need it. Am I correct? It would not need an inspection. It would need a registration. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Major, is it Burek, right? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for your testimony. It's pretty, uh, it was pretty good, actually. I'm just wondering, how many uh, uh, license plate readers does the state police have right now? We just have a few that are for special um, purpose, special events, but we do not have them deployed on patrol vehicles currently. Right. So I'm under the impression you have six. That's, that's very close, sir. Six and or eight. What I'd like to know is, are you using it for criminal investigations mostly? Yes. Stolen vehicles, that kind of stuff? That's correct. Okay. So when you get that information, how long do you keep it? It's at the end of that shift. If we didn't detect a stolen vehicle or the purpose of it, then it's uh, disposed of at the end of the shift. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. Representative Kinsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, both majors for being here. Um, Major ba Basinger, I have just two questions for you very quickly. Um, the information that comes in for the mobile office system, what type of, are you able to share with us the type of information that comes in once an officer plugs in a license plate? Like what, what information does the trooper receive? It, it would, the trooper would receive the name, address, and the status of the registration. And it would also, if there was a, an NCIC hit, say the vehicle was stolen, it would alert the trooper to that as well. Okay. Um, you, I think you, in your testimony, you referred back to Act 89, where we did away with the, the, um, the stickers on the back of the license plate. Um, I represent one of the, probably the largest, in fact, the largest city um, municipality here in the state of Pennsylvania, which is Philadelphia. And I know years ago, um, there was major concerns in the city, in the city such as Philadelphia in regards to um, folks used to actually take clippers and, ch and clip off the sticker of a license plate. I, I'm, I'm the stick, I'm clip off the sticker itself, off the license plate. Um, with with um, House Bill 1509 going back to sticking those stickers on there, I noticed in the past, the stickers used to go in the corner of a license plate. Is there some way that it could be, if, if this bill were to pass, would it be, like, is there an ideal place where this can be placed at this sticker so that someone can't just come and clip off the, the sticker? Is that something that, that, that um, the, the state police have discussed if this bill were to pass? The, the only location that we have discussed is a current location, which is on the corner. Uh, I don't think there's any room, and Section 1332 of, of the Vehicle Code requires it to be on the corner. You can't decorate your registration plate, which uh, yeah. put, people used to put their stickers like the whole way around it or in right. dead yeah. center or obscure their plate, which is a violation. So it has to go somewhere that it's not going to obscure the plate that would obviously deal with the other legislation here. Obscuring the plate would uh, counteract license plate readers as well. Right, I got you. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chair. What's that? That's fine. Oh, Martina. Okay, we'll get to you, Martina. Uh, Representative Namarata. Namarato, I think. I'm sorry. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Um, and thank you both for being here. Um, my questions are specifically around HB 317 um, and around our shared concern for the public's privacy. Um, I noticed in the bill that um, in line 29, it talks about, um, about data and how law enforcement agencies may only share, sell, trade, um, disseminate or exchange captured data um, with other law enforcement agencies or criminal justice agencies in performance of their official duties. I was wondering if you could walk me through a circumstance in which data would be sold or traded. Yes, ma'am. It would never be the intention of the Pennsylvania State Police to sell the data captured on an ALPR system to another entity. However, uh, we may have to engage a vendor to create this solution it may not be able to be done in-house and we just need the language to be loose enough that we can engage a vendor and whatever language is created whether it's trade uh, share um, so that the systems can be interconnected and maybe even interconnected to other jurisdictions but it would never be our intention to sell data okay do you know why the word sell would appear in this bill 
I understand trading and yes. sharing information to set up a, a system that would be used um, to yes. complete your duties. Um, but the kind of being able to profit off of information that's collected from the public is kind of concerning to me. No, I understand. And um, I don't know why that specific word was used, but we would be happy to work with uh, the committee, the other stakeholders to try to figure out the language that would most accurately reflect what we, in, we intend to do. Thank you. Um, and also in this bill, it says that it will store data that's collected for up to a year. So under that circumstance, um, like what would be what would be the case that you would want license plate data stored and accessible that's not part of an active investigation um, stored for a year? That seems like it would be one very expensive um, to have all of that data and two, um, just kind of maybe a risk, a security risk for um, citizens. Yes, sometimes investigations, cr criminal activity is not reported to us right away, uh, particularly in the case of sexual assaults. It's months or sometimes years later. So to be able to go back, a suspect that would tell us, I've never been to that area, I don't know her or him, to be able to go back and query the system once we have vehicle information, could be very probative to our case. Uh, probably the more, the example I think of first is a drug trafficking organization. It often takes a long time to structure that out. There's a main target. We find co-conspirators, other people, and it may be six months, nine months, two years into an investigation before we know the full structure. And LPR data, cell phone data, and many other sources is incredibly valuable to us as we try to identify suppliers and other co-conspirators. Mm -hmm. And where would that data be stored? Would it be at a local municipal level? Would it be at a state level? Is it something that kind of connects to a national system based on the, um, the vendor that delivers these services? Currently, every police department that has uh, a system, they're storing it locally. Um, we, we don't have any oversight of, over that. We're not storing that data. This bill, as I would envision it, would create uh, a secure system at the state level that we would preferably like to house in the Fusion Center where many other sensitive data sources are stored. That way it could be set up with the appropriate controls, audit trails, uh, user identity, and access like we protect all the other information sources. But it would be in one place where it could be universally secured like intelligence information or investigative information. Mm -hmm. And um, when designing the system, who would have access to um, to this database that's being co collected? We'd certainly have to talk to the other stakeholders. Um, I would think most of the municipal police departments would want to be able to directly access a system like they do with JNet uh, or similar clean systems right now. Uh, in other states, sometimes it's only the Fusion Center personnel that have access to a statewide system, but that's the type of language we would have to work out among the stakeholders. Okay. And I know that there is, um, there will be a uh, a policy that would be designed by um, the Pennsylvania State Police. And we'll, as part of this bill, would that policy be made public? Like in, in body camps, for example, that yes. you know that they're not subjected to right to knows, but the policies that they are under are um, accessible to the public. Would that be the same in this circumstance? I guess it would depend how the bill is worded. If we are simply helping to provide the oversight for that policy development and select left up to local municipalities, then it would be up to them to decide whether to do that or not. If it was a Pennsylvania state police policy, some of our policies are open to the public. Some have to be redacted for investigative uh, security mm -hmm. um, and they can't be released in their entirety and some are released in their entirety. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Representative O'Mara. Thank you, Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you both for being here. Uh, my questions are also about uh, HB 317. So you had mentioned that ALPR systems are used in the Commonwealth right now, but not by the state police. Can you, do we know, as, as a member of the public able to see if their township is using it or how, do we know where they're being used right now? We do not have a comprehensive list of every department that's utilizing them. For our Amber Alert program, we have tried to informally um, bring them together so if, if we have to put out an alert we know who to contact but okay. there is not a comprehensive list right now so will this not new, that I possess if this bill becomes law and this is a new system is created are, are we going to encourage other local municipalities to no longer use their system is this going to replace that and work how is that going to work with what's currently in place 
I wouldn't see it as a solution to replace what's going on at the local jurisdictions. That's their decision to make. But we would want to see all the systems interconnected so okay. that the benefit, so that the department in Lehigh County can see what's occurring three counties away that may be on beyond what they can currently query and I think that would benefit everyone okay the criminals simply don't recognize these geopolitical boundaries that we draw <laughs> yeah on. so you'd mentioned other states as well so how does the the sort of um, agreement or you know work between other states about how this data is shared and how long is it going to be shared for up to a year as long as we have it and what other states are we working with for this system there are other states that have contacted us that are interested in sharing ALPR data um, since we don't have a system, we have nothing to connect to currently. New York and New Jersey have just um, managed an agreement where they're sharing data. And the way it works is whatever your restriction is, even if the retention periods are different in each state, you have to honor the retention period of the state you're receiving the information from. And there's ways through the identity management of the system to, to be able to do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Representative White. Uh, just on the on the topic of these other states, are do you feel that the the current structure that we have is sufficient in the way that it's being implemented without the registration stickers? What's happening right now? Oh, as far as um, do, you, do you think that's the ideal case scenario for you keeping our roadways safe and being able to find out and identify violators? Yeah, maybe Major Basinger more. It, could you are you talking about the current registration lack of registration and inspection sticker or are you talking about ALPR usage the current lack of registration stickers on vehicles so you think that that's the ideal case scenario for what you guys your role and responsibilities are when I initially heard about the the uh, stickers disappearing and, and no longer having them as, as a trooper with 25 years and I thought that's a terrible thing but uh, and looking at the statistics and we we have proven it with AOPC statistics that the number of violations have gone up, so it is very effective utilizing the cars. Integrating the ALPR system will also uh, help with that, and I believe the ALPR system will incorporate methods for local PDs to obtain the equipment that we have or similar equipment that would help them. Are there some changes in the current draft of this bill that you'd like to see in order to um, facilitate your vision? The bill is written. We, can't, we, we are opposed to it as written. There could be improvements that would be more palatable. And what, what improvements would you suggest? We would like the, the, register, or the inspection sticker to remain where it's at. Uh, that's where all law enforcement have been trained their entire careers uh, to look for it. And that that is where they look for it now. Um, so moving that to the, the plate would be a, uh, an issue for us. And uh, putting on a plate makes it a, uh, a subject to theft or, uh, or alteration as well. Um, and then can you, I guess I'm a little bit uh, concerned because there's been a number of other uh, associations like the State Troopers Association, the Chiefs of Police, the State FOP. Uh, there's also the Authority, uh, Pennsylvania Auto Theft Prevention Authority, who are in favor of this legislation, and yet uh, your leadership, your uh, command is opposed. So can you explain maybe why that is? We are opposed to it as written because it, it totally circumvents the ins inspection and, and uh, registration system. It turns everything backwards and convolutes it. We feel that the or, uh, registering the vehicle first and then getting it inspected is a, is a proper process. And uh, it would require creating new stickers, as mentioned previously, or some type of certificate that the, uh, the citizen would have to take um, to PennDOT to prove that they uh, they had their vehicle inspected and uh, a lot of garages aren't computerized you may be getting a piece of paper from a mechanic saying yeah I inspected this car and taking it to register it so that would have to be highly regulated and uh, it would be very easily uh, used in fraud to register vehicles that's our position 
Okay, those are all the questions that I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Hahn. Oh, by the way, before you begin, I should, I'm a little late in making the announcement or recognizing that Representative Doyle Heffley from Carbon County had joined us quite a while ago, and I, I'm just getting around to recognize you, Doyle. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Marcia. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to kind of piggyback on, on Representative White. So if they have a sticker that already, you can't get a sticker unless you have the inspections. So that just means you don't have to look at the windshield anymore. You just have to look. You're already looking at the sticker, right? So, I mean, that's, I, I guess I'm not understanding why that's a problem. Did, removing that sticker from the inside of the vehicle makes it subject to, to theft. Oh, easy. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. I got it. Um, placing it on the rear of the vehicle, um, we're all, since the integration of the mobile office system, our officers are really good at running those, and, and they know to do that now. And as mentioned previously, if I would, back when I started 25 years ago, you pulled up behind a car, and if the sticker looked good, you didn't do anything with it because you didn't have a mobile office or anything. Now, if you pull up and there's no sticker or, or you see something, some reason for you to run that plate, you run the plate and you see that it's in canceled for insurance reasons, which that would have never happened when we had this had the stickers so I have a situation where someone wrote the plate number incorrectly uh, for like a parking violation so with with these these scan the plates though correct the the system would scan the plate so the number would not be put in incorrectly like if you hand manually put in a number so if it's supposed to be a one instead of an I and you put it in the wrong way, you just read it wrong. Like this will take care of that so that it's not the way it's scanned. I don't know if you're the right person to ask, but. I think that's yours. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question, ma'am. The uh... So say you're, you're parking somewhere in Philadelphia. I'm going to pick on Philadelphia. And they write the number wrong, all yes. right? So I have one where the, the plate was supposed to be L1L, and they wrote L-I-L, went to a totally different person. They got all kinds of parking sure. tickets. So you now scan that plate. You're going to read the plate the correct way. You're not, because it's scanning it. It's not manually input. I'm just assuming yes. that they put in, whoever hand wrote the ticket right. put it in wrong. I I'm, wouldn't claim to be an expert, but the algorithms, that the, the optic, the character recognition, I would think through as far as advanced as the systems are now, would have a smaller error rate than a human being entering hundreds of those a day. However, there are there are erroneous readings on on the plate reader sometimes, so it's not exempt. Because I think all that. of us get those questions every day. You know, I I wasn't here, so I, I have a ticket from this place or somewhere else. But I think with the you know a scan, it's going to make it a little bit better. I was just curious. With the, with the data being retained in ALPR, that's something that you could go back and. And look at and could be used as exculpatory evidence as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Representative Nielsen. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming today and testifying. The uh, Representative White brought some good things up, and we, uh, just to be clear, do you believe that us putting a sticker on that plate would deter the troopers from putting in the plate numbers in the on car system? I mean, it's, it's kind of like you're checking, double-checking everything anyhow. I, I just doesn't, don't know. Like, Representative Jolly, he talked about 240,000 cars did not register last year. You didn't write 240,000 violations. I know your violations are up, but um, how many violations did you write on that? Can you tell me that number? Because, I mean, 240,000 is a lot of cars. So walking around with no registrations. Let's see. And... 2018, 151,414. Compared to previous years? 2015, 86,092. Thank you. Do you, now, now I'm Philadelphia, okay, everybody's been picking on us today, and, um, and my, my sticker has been clipped with uh, tin snips off my plate. Um, definitely. How about a how about a window sticker in the rear? Would you be more 
um, that we put like an inspection sticker in the rear of the car? Would you be more open to something like that? That would lend more to officer safety and more uh, – that would prevent security uh, – Concerns, Concerns? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, I'm just trying to think of what all the conversation. That's why we have the hearings to try. And, and it seemed to me like if I could put something in the rear of the window that wouldn't deter, we wouldn't, you know, um, block any view or anything like that. Maybe that would be more helpful. That could possibly be more helpful and it would prevent theft. Right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, just one follow up question over that. Uh, my Ever diligent uh, executive director here, Josiah Shelley, said, "What happens when you put the convertible uh, top roof down on the car? The wind, the back windshield disappears, so you know you wouldn't have that the the, the ability to see an inspection sticker at that point." So, well, that chairman, most of us maybe, don't have a convertible, and we're not. Uh, <laughs> no, not that. Not that. You know, I'm not saying the executive director is uh, doing better than most of us. I mean, I, I mean, I would love to have a nice little Corvette convertible, as it was the troopers. I can see by their smiles. Um, however, um, it'd be kind of like a motorcycle. They don't have a windshield in the back as well. It's always en always enjoyable when you show up for meetings, Ed. <laughs> uh, troopers, thank you. Or, I'm sorry, majors. Thank you very much for for your testimony. Thanks for representing the Pennsylvania State Police so well. Thank, thank you. you, Chairman. Our next, our next testifier is Bill Garrity, uh, the Vice President of Vigilant Solutions. Uh, also in your packet, you will see uh, testimony from Scott Petrie, the Executive Director of the Pen Philadelphia Parking Authority. Scott's not able, he had planned to be here today to testify. Um, he's not able to make it, so please uh, note that his, his testimony is in your packet. Now, Mr. Garrity, did I pronounce your last name right? Yes, sir. Okay. Even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while, right? I got it right. Absolutely. Thank you. Begin anytime you're ready. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Bill Garrity, and I am a vice president with Vigilant Solutions, and we are part of Motorola Solutions. I submitted a written statement, and I'd just like to highlight a few points. Vigilant is proud to be the national leader in automated license plate recognition technology, commonly known as ALPR. Our law enforcement customers use our cameras, cloud hosting solutions, and software analytics to generate leads that help them investigate and solve crimes. Thousands of law enforcement agencies in the United States use ALPR every day. We recently surveyed more than 500 enforcement officers across the nation about their use of ALPR. 80% of them said that ALPR either directly or indirectly aided them in their investigations, including cases related to stolen vehicles, gang and drug trafficking, sex crimes, homicides, child abductions, and terrorism. Here in Pennsylvania, several recent news stories show how ALPR data is helping public safety. ALPR recently helped police catch a suspect in a million dollar ATM skimming scheme that included locations in Chambersburg and Carlisle. Last year, it helped find an escaped Upper Darby prisoner in Philadelphia. This past January, an ALPR alert also in Upper Darby led to the arrest of a kidnapping and sexual assault suspect from New Hampshire. And just a few months ago, it helped identify suspects in a mall shooting in Monroeville. And in June, led to the arrest of a New York suspect from a Poconos murder case. And these stories are just the tip of the iceberg. ALPR data helps in these kinds of cases every single day, and most are not publicly reported. We believe responsible use of ALPR data is imperative, and it's also the norm amongst law enforcement agencies. And we are an evangelist of ALPR policies. We support policies that ensure ALPR data is available to investigators to help solve crimes and save lives. However, we also support policies that ensure accountability around the use of ALPR data by law enforcement. We have engaged with dozens of legislatures around the country, and we found that a few key principles result in sound legislation. Those include, one, access controls and audits for law enforcement, two, requiring a legitimate law enforcement purpose for LPR data and hot list access, three, ensuring data can be shared amongst agencies, and four, limiting public records access to ALPR data that is collected by law enforcement. 
House Bill 317 appears to us to contain these principles. With several provisions added and amended over the past few sessions, it is clear that members of this body have worked painstakingly to architect smart legislation that benefits all Pennsylvanians and stays true to the original intent, a law that ensures that law enforcement has the technology it needs to help investigate and solve crime and to keep Pennsylvania communities safe. So as this committee reviews and revises the language of House Bill 317 to make sure it is straightforward, we will be available to answer questions based upon our technical expertise. Furthermore, since this legislature removed the requirement for vehicles to display valid registration stickers a few years ago, ALPR data has been discussed as a vehicle registration enforcement tool. While it can certainly be used very effectively for this purpose, that only represents a small portion of the value that law enforcement gets from ALPR technology. The other bill before this committee, House Bill 1509, would reinstitute the requirement for registration stickers. We believe that both of these bills can coexist and be supported to help law enforcement enforce vehicle registration laws, improve officer safety, and generate leads in all types of investigations. Thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Garrity. Uh, I have two. Vigilant is a manufacturer of an ALPR system. That is correct, sir. And how many other uh, similar manufacturers are there? How many options does a police department or the Pennsylvania State Police have in terms of uh, selecting either your system or someone else's? Sure. I mean, there there's smaller companies, there's larger companies. The, the major players in the market, there's probably a half a dozen. Okay. To a dozen companies that, that regularly service the law enforcement market. Okay. And who gets to enter into the, 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 the data bank, so to speak, uh, a license plate number so that when, a, when that license plate passes through a, or past a, an ALPR, that it actually pings and, and gives you a, a hit on that, that plate. You know what I'm saying? I understand it when police put on an APB and they say, right. oh, my God, be on the license, the look, for, Bolo, look out for this Bolo, particular one. Yeah. Who, but can I call it up and say I want to find out where my, my nephew is or my son or daughter is uh, and put, uh, you know, my personal license plate right. in, from the car that they're driving? Not, certainly not on our platform. Um, okay. you know, the, our, we service the law enforcement community, so if a, if a BOLO alert, be on the lookout alert, is published for AMBER alerts or whatever the reason may be, there are uh, very specific uh, processes that are followed in terms of putting that information into a system that would trigger an alert, and then the distribution of that obviously is also contained within the law enforcement community. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, well, by the, one, yes, one further question. You said that we could use this as a registration enforcement tool. Right. Uh, that would re require Vigilant to apply to, say, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. The Department of Transportation would have to then decide, separate from any police activity, that they were going to provide, make that information right. available to you? It becomes basically another type of list or hot list verification list, right, that says these are the valid plates. These are the, the vehicles that have uh, kept their registration up to date. If you scan a vehicle and it's not on that list, it would trigger an, an audible and visual alert for the officer in the vehicle that says just scan that plate it doesn't appear to have a valid registration so okay and you can do that i mean i think we have five or six million cars on the road here in pennsylvania yep you can it can automatically read through that that you know i know computers are fast that's pretty fast right very similar to so the, the parking operation here in harrisburg right you go to the the, the the parking meter and you put in your license plate number and then going down the street it can read the license plates and you're either paid in the system or you're not paid in the system Okay, but that doesn't go the next step, and it doesn't tell them whether or not I've registered the car properly. Sure. Or, okay. Yep. All right, thank you. Uh, yep. We have some questions for you. Representative Rothman. First of all, thank you for Jay. coming here, and uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for what your, your company is doing. Can you just walk us through, uh, and you mentioned um, several crimes that were solved because of this technology. Can you just walk us through and pick one of the seven um, the, the procedure, how it happened, and, and what what uh, the crime takes place, and then you take it from there. I think it would be helpful to the members of the committee and to me personally to, to understand how your system works. Absolutely. So so most people, when they think about ALPR, um, think about the, the front-end value of it, right? So so you there's a, a list of license plates. For whatever reason, they're of interest to law enforcement. When the camera reads it, it's looking to see, is it on that list or not? It's triggering what's called a, 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 an alert off of a hot list. But that's only really a small portion of the value, right? So the hot list could be 
uh, amber alerts. It could be stolen vehicles. It could be vehicles wanted uh, associated with a previously committed homicide. But the investigative value, that the, the, the largest value, certainly in my opinion, that uh, people fail to forget is the is as Major Burek alluded to earlier. Sometimes crimes aren't reported till later on, or pattern crimes. Uh, when you're looking at uh, an area of interest where maybe there's an arson investigation, you have ten fires that have some s similarities to them. So can you use the technology to determine are vehicles showing up at all these arson locations based upon ALPR reads from those areas and then tying that data together to say, okay, we have a vehicle that was at eight of the ten fires and on the date and time of interest. Then who's the registered owner and then is that a potential suspect to our investigation? That's just one example of how something like that might be used. Yep. Is that it? <laughs> Greg, you done? Uh, next we have Representative Amara. Uh, thank you for your testimony. So I just have a question. It's sort of similar along the lines of Greg's question. So it says in here ALPR does not contain any personal information. So there's no address or name in the record. That is correct. Then how is it beneficial? So I guess you just need to explain to me how, how does it work with law enforcement? How do they take your photo and identify sure. a so person? Using the two examples I just referenced. So in the hot list example, it's um, a state, usually uh, the FBI or the NCIC is publishing a hot list that's getting pushed down and saying these are vehicles of interest and then they have some type of alert associated with them. Again, amber alert, stolen vehicle, whatever the case may be. Um, so it's reading the, the, it's doing what's called OCR, optical character rec recognition of the, of the numbers and letters on the plate and it's saying is this matched to anything on the list and then it's providing that alert in the vehicle. On the other side of the process, again, it's just, uh, it's, it's reading the license plate uh, it's capturing a record of it no different than if we were to walk out in the parking lot right now with our smartphones and just take a picture of vehicles in the parking lot. Yeah, I, no, I understand yeah. that part. But I'm saying how do they, and I get getting a hot list. Sure. They they know who they're looking for. But mm -hmm. how are you using this as a registration tool? How are you determining that the car is or is not registered Sorry, if I, you I, don't have a name or address connected to the ALPR record? So it's, it's, it's merely just providing the... Uh, Again, the OCR is reading the, the letters and numbers. It's triggering the alert. Then the, the law enforcement officer would go to another system then to validate what's called RO or registered owner data. Oh, okay. So the, the, the two databases do not touch and nor should they. ALPR records should be separate. Plate data is anonymous. PII, personally identifiable information, is then stored in DMV and other databases that require permissible purpose under the Driver Privacy Protection Act that law enforcement would then be able to access and verify. Now, ABC123, who is the registered owner of that plate? So does, I, I, does, it, does that work faster than what they're currently doing, which sounds like pulling up and entering in? I, I did a ride along in May. I saw how quick it is to check. Yeah, I mean. It's pretty it, quick. So does this work <laughs> that same seamless process? It's, it, 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 it certainly could. Um, it doesn't sound like it the way you just described it to me, well, but that could be just because of the way we're at. The, the, the entry process certainly is more automated, right? So, so um, I'm some, some officers are very proficient with, operating the vehicle and, and entering tags, or if they have the luxury of having a second officer in the car, that, that gives them that benefit. Um, but, you know, I, I think about, you know, the, the, the push in the country to have all of our attention on the road, and if the cameras can capture that information passively without the officer having to take away their attention, it just, it makes it more safe. I guess I'm just not understanding how it works. If an officer pulls up behind someone and that car is not registered, how your system is working to tell them okay. it's not. That's so, the part that I'm not So, So the, whether it's the, you know, if it were talking, so in PennDOT for the, in this case would have to provide a routine file of valid registration. Got it. Okay. Yes. So, so you're the, able to see this is yes or no registered right. accurately. It would have to be some type of regularly published file that includes so the So that's valid how you do plate. system sharing. Okay. That's correct. Yes. That makes a lot more yep. sense. Sorry, I wasn't clear. Okay. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Thank you. Representative Schroeder. Thank you so much for being here. Yep. Um, Sarah. Kind of twofold question. One, could you define what ALPR data is? Sure. So it is, uh, it is a picture of the vehicle and the license plate. It's a date and time stamp of when it sees it. It's the geolocation code, so the latitude and longitude of where that uh, vehicle was seen, and, and that's really it. So you have, and then what the camera read the characters as. So did it read it as ABC123 or A8C123? What did it read the plate as? What does the picture look like? Date and time stamp, geolocation. Okay. That's what constitutes an LPR packet. Okay. Okay. So then my second question is, does your technology have the ability to record speeds of vehicles? Um, on fixed locations, there is some element of being able to do that. 
Uh, for our particular platform, we don't uh, recommend it as a speed enforcement tool, mm -hmm. but it could, like, so for example, if you put up fixed cameras around the school zone, uh, you could see average speed and then say, well, maybe it makes sense to up, up patrols in this area given times of day or days of the week. So you can draw data out of it, but I wouldn't use the information out of the cameras as a, like they do in Maryland for speed enforcement. There but it does have the ability, you're saying, the, to, to, to provide, yeah, but the, the radar technology used when you're deploying speed enforcement technology would have to supplement the ALPR cameras. You wouldn't rely solely on the ALPR cameras to provide the, the evidentiary tool of, of a speeding violation. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Thank you, Representative Venamorato. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Finally. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Um, thank you for being here. I was hoping that you could talk about um, Vigilant and if you have a separate database that's um, independent of the one that would be used by state law enforcement in Pennsylvania. Yes. So um, there is another source of data that resides on our system. It's often referred to as commercial data, mm -hmm. which uh, is uh, data that comes through the uh, vehicle and asset recovery industry. So it's, a, it's actually a sister uh, company that, that uh, has an affiliate network of asset recovery vehicles uh, looking for vehicles eligible for repossession or insurance violations and things of that nature. So that data is, resides separately but is accessible to law enforcement if they need it for their investigations. Would the hardware that the local law enforcement that local law inform, enforcement puts on their vehicles or puts on our streets to read license plates, would that data ever enter into the commercial side of your database? No, never. Okay. Um, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Are you done? Uh, Representative Hefley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, uh, Vigilant Solutions. Like, How many companies are out there in the nation that compete and do the same thing that you do? What kind of competition is there? It's a fair question. Uh, I get asked it from time to time. So, I mean, in, in terms of um, just providing the ALPR technology, because we do a couple other supplemental in investigative technologies for law enforcement, um, but sp specific to the LPR space, as I mentioned earlier uh, to Chairman, it's, there's about a half a dozen to a dozen companies that vie for LPR technology that are major players in the law enforcement market. And now, uh, with your technology, so you provide the cameras? So do you provide the, the unit that goes in the vehicle itself so that you have the hardware and you're also providing the software and the, and the cloud accessibility? Yeah. You do everything. So, so we provide mobile LPR cameras, and those would go on to a patrol vehicle. We provide fixed LPR cameras, which would be affixed to some type of infrastructure uh, that's a permanent camera. And then, uh, yes, the software, the analytics, hosting, things of that nature. All right. So, so one of the concerns, and, and I got to say that the, um, most of my uh, departments that have these types of technologies, they, they find them to be tremendously beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that the police departments found the, the stickers on a license plate to be tremendously beneficial, and, right. and I think they still, they still are. Uh, the problem is the cost. Um, many of our local or, or smaller police departments are struggling just to, to cover uh, you know, the 24 hours in a day to have police coverage. Many of them are, are laying off and, and, and relying on state police at certain hours just because of the cost of, of everything that's involved in law enforcement these days. Right. Um, the stickers on the license plate, while I understand PennDOT had a burden that, that was a cost to them, the burden that we have now placed on these smaller departments is really becoming to the point where a lot of departments are getting rid of their, their police uh, because you know, you're taking everything else into account, the, all the costs of... Uh, of uh, labor costs and equipment costs, and now uh, these costs. I mean, what is the average cost of of, of the system per per vehicle uh, when when you're putting them in? I'm, I'm hearing anything anywhere between twelve thousand up to twenty thousand dollars. That's a fair number uh, in yeah. terms of the cost for a mobile system, correct? So if you're looking at a small department that maybe has four to five cruisers, that's eighty to a hundred. It could be eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. Sure. And, and how long do these sorry. systems last? So you know, it's it, it's the system last is going to be contingent upon how well it's maintained, just like anything else. If you change the oil in your car and you take care of your car, it'll last a, lo a lot longer than somebody who doesn't. Properly maintained you know, mobile system should last an agency five to seven years on average, maybe longer, maybe less, depending upon how much abuse they take. I know that there's a lot of similar technologies right now. We're seeing it in the, in the 
commercial industry right now. They're putting cameras on, on most of your commercial vehicles that are on the road for liability protection. Sure. Um, and there, there's all kinds of different software programs that go into all kinds of vehicles, whether they be a, um, you know, commercial vehicles or any company vehicles now are, are monitoring how many miles. And, and satellite technology is already built in most of the cars. The Ford manufacturing, for example, that might have been data mines, all the information, every stop you make, how fast you drive, where you go, every person that drives a Ford, that information is recorded back to the Ford Motor Company they use, and they sell that information. I, I guess I'm just kind of astonished that we can't get that cost down. Why Why is it so expensive for these units and these vehicles? What is what? What is the cost driver that, that we can have this in every every new car pretty much coming off the assembly line has almost the same capabilities minus the cameras. Right. Um, but yet, why is the cost so expensive um, for these companies to put this in, in the in the police uh, into police cruisers and 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 that type of stuff? All right. Fair question. So so to some degree, that's kind of what the market will bear, right? Um, and uh, and and you know, the, the well, like I would say, the market doesn't bear it because a, a lot of your local police department. That's why they're looking for the sticker yet because they just can't afford it. Right. The, the adoption rate will never be 100 percent with with LP, ALPR technology for that very reason, which is why we you know had supported uh, actually saying both bills could coexist. Right. So I, I even go back to the reference of parking earlier. So uh, there was a shift in the parking industry several years ago, particularly here in the United States, to go to plate based parking. And you had two communities here in Pennsylvania. State College was the first, followed by Pittsburgh, that led that charge in the U.S. to go to plate-based parking. Now, plate-based parking has come a long way. It's found its way here to Harrisburg, but it's never going to become the standard and the only way to deploy and enforce parking in this country. It's 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 one of the most efficient ways, but it never, for, for a variety of reasons, cost included, why you, it's never going to go full-blown plate-based. Um, so, to you know, to to answer your specific question, I mean, the 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 market. To some degree, right now, for for uh, communities that are see the value, see the efficiency, are, are are kind of in that sweet spot. And it's not to say that systems don't cost less; they they certainly do. And there's some systems that cost more. Um, but uh, you know, it, the market will drive the price where you know ultimately it, it needs to be. Well, I I would just say that I mean, obviously, in this type of market, you're looking at at public safety, mm -hmm. taking the stickers off of the vehicles. Uh, a lot of law enforcement use that not, you know, to make sure that people had their car registered. But a lot of times, other criminal activity, for some reason, <laughs> a lot of criminals generally don't register their car, and then they get caught with contraband and other sure. things. And it's been very beneficial for law enforcement to use that as a tool. Sure, uh, this tool has come along, uh, and it's it's a much more efficient tool, and, a mu and, and it's a lot better. And I and I've heard it from from our law enforcement officers that I represent right. that they they love the, the, these items are, are great for them. Mm -hmm. However, I'm just looking at the cost of it, and I'm and I'm wondering what do we need to do to bring this cost down because it's it is really a burden. And and the fact of the matter is when when it's that cost prohibitive, and now you've taken that other thing away from them, mm -hmm. and whether we can get something in, through the legislative process, which has been a couple of years now, right. to get that sticker back on, I would just really encourage companies like yours and others to really increase the competition because I, I still think that the cost is, is too high uh, for the other technology that are out there right now. I mean, I would say probably in a couple of years, you're just going to mount a cell phone on the dash of a car and have all that technology. Uh, yeah. And yet we're spending a lot of money up front right now. And, and I guess that's my question is what do we need to do to bring that cost down? Yeah. I mean, uh, there's uh, people a lot smarter than me that ultimately will make those decisions. Um, but uh you know, the, it, it, your point is, is certainly well received and, uh, you know, we'll, we always look to find a balance between um, the technology we deploy, knowing the cost of entry, knowing what the greater good is of, of, this, of the services we're trying to provide and, and uh, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, thank you. Representative Hahn. Thank you, Chairman. So the other day I'm on the turnpike and there's an Amber Alert. Okay. So as you're going through Easy Pass, it, especially if you use the fast lanes, it takes a photo of your plate, correct? Um, I'm not I, I, I'm not an expert on all the, the, the passive tolling systems. The, the ones that I am aware of, yes. In addition to the RFID reader reading the, 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 the presence of the tag itself, they're supplementing them with L, ALPR cameras in the lane for the people that go through that don't have the tag or even just to do toll by mail. So will they be merged or are they already merged? So if if that vehicle would have gone through into New Jersey or into Ohio, would that have been picked up on an easy pass camera and then sent somewhere so that they would know that car? We already know what plate we're looking for. So would that have showed up somehow or can it? 
Yeah, I, I guess the potential is is how many of the databases communicate, right? It becomes the answer to your question because the, you know, from a from a process standpoint, you can disseminate a hot list to multiple ALPR databases, right? So you can load it to your DOT list, your, you know, local PD list, however you disseminate hot lists uh, down to the various systems. But obviously the more that databases communicate, it's less systems to have to push it down to. So it really comes down to distribution. And but that would be something they could implement if they... Technically, it's possible. Technically possible. Technically possible. Whether it's in practice today would depend upon whether the, the databases actually communicate with one another. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Not seeing any other uh, questioners. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Garrity, for your testimony. It was helpful. Good. Very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'll remind you that we have testimony in written form from Scott Petrie from the Philadelphia Parking Authority. Uh, our next panel of testifiers uh, are testifying on behalf of the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association. We have Greg Rowe, who's the Director of Legislation and Policy for them, Jim Martin, the District Attorney in Le Lehigh County, Ed McCann, the First Assistant DA in Montgomery County, and Daniel Warg, who's a County Detective from Lehigh County. So, gentlemen, if you just grab your seats, tell us uh, your names, please, and then uh, you can begin. Who, who's going to kick off the testimony? You are? Okay. Yep. And you're going to be Greg Rowe then, right? Sir. Okay. <laughs> See, I have a keen sense of the Fair. obvious, man. It just. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, good uh, afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting us uh, and allowing us to, uh, to testify. I'm Greg Rowe, the Director of Legislation and Policy for the uh, District Attorneys Association. Uh, I can introduce uh, the panel. Um, Ed McCann is the first assistant district attorney from Montgomery County. Uh, next to Ed is uh, Jim Martin, who's the elected DA from uh, Lehigh County. And then Daniel Warg, uh, next, to, next to Jim, uh, is a county detective uh, from, from Jim's office. Um, you have our testimony. We're, we're not going to read it. Um, uh, but what uh, we want to do uh, during the hearing is to uh, point out some further success stories of, of the ALPRs. Um, and uh, Jim and, and Danny are here. Uh, Lehigh County uses uh, ALPRs uh, in conjunction with its fusion center. So really to put that sort of operational perspective on, on what Lehigh County does and some of the successes, um, as well as discussing uh, some of the, the privacy issues and where there are some points in the bill that really get at protecting public information, ensuring audits and audit trails, which I think can address and do address um, concerns that, that some people have and that provisions that we would, we, we would certainly support. Um, and then finally, um, I'd be remiss if we didn't uh, add our names to the list of law enforcement groups that support Representative Joswiak's bill, uh, really for the reasons that he so eloqu eloquently stated and for the reasons that are uh, set forth in the letters from, uh, from the other law enforcement groups. Um, with that, uh, if Jim and Danny want to, uh, are, are going to uh, discuss their perspective uh, up in Lehigh County in terms of what, what they do very specifically with the ALPRs. Thank you, thank Greg, you. and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. Uh, a couple of amplifications. Dan Warg was previously uh, an assistant chief of police in Allentown and has a wealth of information about the technology that Allentown Police Department and the city deploys, uh, among which are several hundred cameras, which are unrelated to ALPR, but he also has worked closely with uh, my office now and is in his current capacity as a county detective to establish fixed ALPR units in several locations, uh, one of which I pass through on a daily basis coming both from, from and to my home, and I accused him of having installed it at that particular location to keep tabs on my comings and goings. But that's a that's just a, a frivolous. He denied aside. any responsibility. In he, that does, regard, he does. Right? Yeah. He does. He he denies anything about that. But he works closely in in a, a enterprise that we have in Lehigh County called the Regional Intelligence and Investigation Center. And I would correct my friend Greg. It's not a fusion center because it's only dedicated to law enforcement. We have over six million police incident reports, which are now both from Lehigh and Northampton County, uh, thanks in part to Representative Hans. Uh, help in, in that regard in Northampton County, which we appreciate very much. But uh, it's truly a regional intelligence and investigation center. And that's, from my perspective, where uh, ALPR technology is most helpful in the investigation and solving of crimes. Uh, although I, I, I agree that it's important in terms of enforcement of vehicle laws, in Lehigh County, our experience has been that it has helped 
tremendously in the enforcement of, of uh, and, and prosecution primarily of more serious offenses. Uh, we solved, at least in part, a homicide through ALPR uh, technology because uh, we had a, a mobile unit on a police vehicle uh, that disputed the suspect's uh, alibi that he was in a different location and could not have been at the location where the homicide took place, which was in a barber shop on Main Street in Allentown on Hamilton Street. Uh, that's you know certainly a, a legitimate use. We have, as part of my office, uh, thanks to the Auto Theft Prevention Authority, Executive Director Wheeler is here. Uh, we've had a auto theft task force in Lehigh County since 1996. I think it's one of 10 in the Commonwealth. They employ ALPR technology extensively. And uh, I know from uh, data obtained from, from that unit that uh, over about 393 hours of mobile ALPR usage, uh, they recovered 15 stolen vehicles and seven stolen license plates. So it, it's, it's readily apparent that from an investigative standpoint, ALPR legislation uh, such as this, which obviously I support, uh, is important to a law enforcement enterprise. So I would urge uh, that, that the committee recommend uh, the passage of this bill, and I hope that the full House would consider it as well as the, the Senate and the Governor. I, I'd like to ask. Uh, hey, thank uh, you for your testimony. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to the committee today. Uh, just in the form of housekeeping, I, I saw that some members might not uh, understand the way the systems work. Every day we download from the state and from the FBI a list, and that list we get through JNET from PennDOT, which contains all the license plates that are suspended, all the license plates that are revoked, and from the FBI we get all the stolen license plates across the country. We download that list every day and update it every morning, and the old list that is in the system gets pushed out. So the data that's in there is, is current to that day. Uh, once those lists are, are loaded, then that is what the, the ALPRs read off of or hit off of. It's not a live system like we heard from the state police where it automatically goes in and, and queries the system live. Uh, this data is to be used only as an alert to the officers who then go into their mobile data terminals or their computers to confirm that that vehicle is still stolen, to confirm that the vehicle registration is expired or whatever data they get from the ALPRs. Just to give you a little background, I'd like to walk you through one case of how this data is used naturally with the exception of, so you can see how it's used without for an expired registration sticker. In July of 2017, at least four armed robberies occurred in the Lehigh Valley area. The suspect appeared to have used a U-Haul box truck as the getaway vehicle uh, in this, these robberies. Uh, knowing that nearly all U-Haul trucks are registered in Arizona and that they all start with the letter A, we were able to go into the uh, ALPR system and do a wild card search, which is a search for plates that maybe we don't have the whole plate well, we were able to do that by putting in A in a wild card, and we came back with naturally a whole bunch of U-Haul vehicles in the area of the robberies. After reviewing the images, uh, and we located both of those trucks that we had a, had a distinctive reflective sticker on the back of the trucks. Now, our ALPRs only take a picture of the rear of the vehicle and the license plate. That's, that's all that we store, along with the time it occurred, where it occurred, the uh, latitude and longitude. So that's all the data that is stored. In our system, we store the data for one year, and it's kept on secure server that we own, uh, that, that the district attorney has sole control over. Uh, about... Uh, the, on the nights of the robbery, a check with U-Haul indicated that the truck had been rented in Georgia the previous month, but had never been returned. A bolo was put out for the vehicle. A few nights after the bolo, another armed robbery occurred at a store in Bethlehem. Upon arrival of police, the actors were gone. However, an officer who had seen the bolo observed a parked U-Haul truck a few streets away. The license plate matched the one obtained through the LPR data, and the actors were located hiding in the back of the truck. 
So in that case, multiple suspects who had no known links to the area were arrested and charged with multiple armed robberies. Uh, I have plenty of examples like this, but I'm not going to read further. Uh, one that I, I liked was a 2017 bank robbery incident where we actually got the license plate of a Jeep. And uh, one of our analysts at the, the RIC just ran the plate to see if it could be of any assistance in the license plate reader system. And the picture from the back of the Jeep had a distinctive tire cover on it. Well, that was not broadcast during, the, uh, during or after the robbery, so we were able to provide a picture and send it out to them of this Jeep with this distinctive <coughs> cover on, and the vehicle was located. Uh, I, I feel that the, the investigative uses of the ALPR far outweigh the uses for uh, issuing citations for suspended registrations. That being said, it is a tremendous tool for that. Uh, and we keep finding that vehicles were pulled over from the officers using the system, uh, pulling it over and getting probable cause just for their expired registration, which have led to drug arrests, which have led to numerous firearms confiscations, numerous other violations, domestic warrants. It, it is impossible to uh, associate a number or how many crimes were prevented by the use of this technology but I can assure you that there were a lot that were by the amount of firearms and uh, suspects that we removed from the streets of uh, Lehigh Valley. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to make one other comment that sure. uh, because of the Regional Intelligence and Investigation Center, uh, we are very closely adherent to the Criminal History Record Information Act, which for those who have concerns about the privacy of this information, law enforcement is precluded from disseminating secondarily investigative information. So the, the protections that are incorporated in the bill now, I think, are very sound. Uh, but beyond that, we have the Criminal History Record Information Act, which would control whatever we did with investigative information and intelligence information, for that matter. OK. Jim, I had a question for you. I understand you know, we put these uh, uh, license plate readers in a, in a policeman's car, and he, you know, pull somebody over and get information about him before he approaches the vehicle. So it enhances his safety, I guess. I'm trying to figure out why, what, what prompted your department to put in fixed license plate readers or you know, permanent readers at a particular site. We, we only have two okay. at, at the moment. Uh, if I had my way and if I had the resources, I would put them in every logical location of ingress and egress from Lehigh County. And the reason I would do it, sir, is because we have a significant gang problem in Lehigh County and throughout the region, uh, both Northampton, Lehigh, Berks County. Uh, we have a conduit from northern New Jersey and New York called I-78. And a lot of our issues, or a lot of our street violence, is related to those gang problems. And those people, there, there's a large migration and uh, the, the departure from Lehigh County when crimes are committed. Uh, the same thing is true, and there's a, a great deal of transience between Lehigh County, Berks County, and other points west, where if we could capture uh, license plates and, and descriptions of vehicles, we would be further advanced in terms of investigating those violent crimes. It's not intrusive, in my opinion. <laughs> Obviously, as I said, kiddingly, I, I go through that intersection every day. I don't care if people in, the, you know, in law enforcement know my comings and goings. Yeah, but doesn't that have the potential to overload the systems? Well, we only keep the data. In, in Lehigh County, we keep it for a year. And, uh, but do you download it every night so that the, the you know, I forget the terminology, but the, the recent memory is, is fresh every day when it's it, It's fresh every day, I believe, but Danny's. Yes, we, we download those lists, and the old lists are expunged from the system, and the new list is what it, the system constantly reads. So every day that's exchanged, so that's static. Okay. But there is a, there is a, a server with, on which we house data for the period of a year, right? Correct? That's okay. the actual data from the license plate. Okay. Chairman Carroll has a uh, question. So Jim, thank you. Uh, I'm a Luzerne County resident and represent part of Lackawanna County as well. And my one very small third-class city has an ALR reader. And from talking to the chief of police there, it's, it's a siloed situation where the police officers in that third class city have access to that information, but it really isn't shared in a broader universe. Am I hearing you say that in Lehigh County, 
Is this just the city of Allentown that has this? Or do any of the other smaller departments uh, we, in Lehigh County have an ALR? Yes, many of them do. And what do they do with the information? Is there siloed or is there shared? It is shared. It has the capability of being shared. It isn't automatically shared at this point. We would like it to be. But do they share it? They, they share it among each other, sure. And, and with you? Yeah. So all of the local departments in Lehigh County that have an ALR send the information to a central data storage? Uh, I'm going to let, I'm going to defer to. All, all the departments in Lehigh County have a, we have one central server that, that uh, the DA was kind enough to purchase. All that data is housed in that one central server. So yes, every department in Lehigh County who has an ALPR and even some that don't through the RIC have access to that data by requesting it. But all the data is stored in one location in the Lehigh County servers. So even though uh, different townships have readers, it, the back end or the, the software that drives it is housed at Lehigh County and uh, is stored in one location. Representative Carroll, Montgomery County is the same way. Montgomery County Department of Public Safety houses all that. Yeah. One, one other thing, the, the RIC, we, we employ three crime analysts at the RIC, so a police department. What is the RIC? The RIC is the Regional Intelligence and Investigation Center. I'm sorry. Uh, Representative Hahn has had a demonstration of it, and so has Representative Hafley. Uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's a wonderful tool. And one of the reasons why I brought my cell phone up here was to tell you, you know, just by way of example, I graduated from law school, went into law practice in 1973, back when there were electric typewriters and whiteout and carbon paper. And, and this is where we've arrived. So, you know, technology really drives the world, and that's why we've developed these things in Lehigh County. We have a, we have a digital forensics lab on the, on the campus of DeSales University, which downloads cell phone and, and hard drives and that kind of stuff as well, which is, you know, the way law enforcement needs to go. And frankly, law enforcement has been lagging behind the rest of the world in terms of technology. And this, I, is a, this is a step forward. I applaud both of the counties. It seems like that's a smart thing to do with respect to sharing the information. When I consider in Luzerne County, we don't have too many departments that have the readers, but, uh, you know, my third class city, 8,000 people has one, uh, a significant investment. But I'm not sure that they're getting the full benefit if, they, if the information that they're collecting is just siloed within within their department. Well, we, we make a real effort to share information in both Lehigh and Northampton County, a regional, a regional approach. I should also mention that the Allentown Parking Authority has LPRs, and that data is fed in to the system as well. And to try to be more direct in, in your original question, of the 16 police, municipal police departments in Lehigh County, which includes the Bethlehem City Police Department, because part of Bethlehem is in Lehigh County, uh, I, I believe maybe seven or eight have ALPRs, mobile units on their vehicles, and I, I can't tell you the exact number of units in usage, but I'm, I'm sure it's uh, in excess of a couple dozen. And so if the state police were to incorporate a statewide data server system, I can assume that both Lehigh and Montgomery County would be in favor of, of that sort of a, of a statewide proposal. If it's good enough for the county, it seems to me it should, should be good enough sure, for 67. We, we, I, I left here earlier to, to uh, talk to Major Burek about uh, Pennsylvania State Police have recently uh, developed a, a records management system, which we'd love to get access to at the Regional Intelligence Center. And I left here to talk to him about that and see if I could get him to get the commissioner to come up and see the rec. Uh, we'd love to share that information statewide. Good. Thank you. I would just um, add a few things. I mean, you've heard a lot of success stories. There have been um, two pretty pretty major homicides in the southeast part of the state where um, automatic license plate readers were instrumental in solving the case. One was the quadruple homicide in Bucks County um, where they were able to put the defendant's car in the vicinity of where the victim's car was found and basically refute his alibi, helped solve a quadruple murder. And then in, in a Norristown shooting, we had uh, a young man, 16-year-old, murdered and a friend of his shot and wounded um, the automatic license plate readers put uh, the driver of a drive-by shootings car um, in the area right before the shooting. I would also point out that I think this bill does a really good job of uh, dealing with a lot of the concerns that civil liberties folks have had about these. Um, it really incorporates a lot of things that um, people have had objections to in terms of um, I, there was a question earlier about the selling and trading of data. Well, that's actually happened in other states, particularly in New York State, because they didn't have a law that prevented that from happening. 
um, and this does, which is good. I mean, and, and Pennsylvania is really um, going to be, I think, pretty much on the forefront of this because I don't think that there's many states that have regulations of, of these now. I think only 16 states have laws concerning uh, APLR data and its use and regulation. So we would be um, in the first third of states, really, that uh, have had some regulations on, this, on these issues. Well, we are the state that formed the uh, Declaration of Independence and led us into a war with uh, Great Britain, or with England at the time, and, and look at where we are today. So it's a good start. Thanks for the compliment. Uh, Representative Mar or Martina White. Thanks, Chairman. Um, yeah, I think as we try to balance the people's right to privacy, um, can you just discuss the cameras that are stationary in communities and um, what kind of, are they only capturing the back of the vehicles or is they capturing a whole lot more than that and then it's just sectioned down to the back of the vehicles? Like how is that differentiated? Well, the, the fixed AP, ALPR cameras in Lehigh County capture the back of the vehicle and the license plate and oh. that's all. Okay. But the city of Allentown, I may have confused the issue a little bit, they have uh, many fixed cameras at intersections throughout the city. How many, Dan? Probably over 180. Yeah. Uh, Dan was primarily responsible for it when he was uh, assistant chief of operations at the Allentown Police Department. Those cameras have proved uh, wonderfully effective in terms of law enforcement investigations. We had a, a shooting in Allentown at a, at a bar recently in June where 10 people were shot exiting the bar. One of those cameras, not an ALPR camera, but a fixed camera, uh, caught the vehicle that was the suspect vehicle and led the police to arrest at least one of the individuals responsible for that shooting. So, you know, th th it, that, that technology helped us solve another homicide four or five years ago by capturing a photograph of, of the perpetrator's vehicle, which was then being driven by his victim, who was a young woman, who he later subsequently, a couple hours later, murdered, uh, but captured that vehicle in transit on a street in Allentown and when we coupled that with data that we obtained from a, from a cell phone, we were able to convict a man of, of murder through that kind of technology. So it's terrific, terrifically useful in both law enforcement and prosecution. And just as a follow-up, can you describe the process in which one police department requests information off of the network in order to facilitate an investigation? Like, do they have to submit it paperwork? Do they just call you up and say, hey, can we get this footage from such and such, or how does it work? They don't get footage. We, we, we have a process known as an RFI, a request for information that is filed by the police departments, and our analysts will look at the data then and examine it, and if there is anything found, they will respond usually back to the detectives from the requesting agency. And it's done by email. Yes. And are there ever times that you decline requests from any of the police departments? Not from a law enforcement agency that I'm aware of, no. These are all for the only time that we do request are for law, lawful law enforcement purposes. That's the only time that the system is accessed. Okay. And, and, and there is an audit trail of that in the REC at all times. We can tell you everybody who's ever accessed the REC and all the police departments in now both Lehigh and Northampton County can access it from their own police station. But overall, I mean, obviously, the sharing of information between various police agencies has been helpful in the investigatory process and has obviously led to a number of, uh, you know, solved cases. So that's great. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you. I have a question with regard to, uh, we've had a lot of testimony, and everybody seems to say we take a picture of the license plate in the rear of the car. But, like, once you get a hit on that and know that somewhere at the, corner of uh, Wilson and Mount Vernon Street in Pottstown, for example, that there's been a hit on that car, you might be able, or that license plate rather, you might be able to find uh, uh, surveillance cameras in that area if you focus it, and then it would tell you a whole lot more about the car, like whether it had dents in the front fender, or whether it had a, you know, a, a contrasting color, or, you know, some of the body marks that you see when people are trying to repair cars. You can probably get a lot more information just by using the initial hit by the license plate reader to tell the police where to go in their searches for these kind of fixed uh, surveillance cameras. Well, I, I would agree with that. Uh, 
Well, not using an ALPR, but a, a, a real quick anecdote. We had a homicide several years ago uh, where uh, two, two witnesses, not necessarily to the shooting, which occurred outside of a bar, but two witnesses described a man running to a dark-colored SUV. We didn't have a license plate. We had a description that said the brake lights came off the, appeared to come off the roof. The detectives, being good investigators, looked at manufacturer's information and determined that it was more likely than not uh, either a Honda CRV or a Toyota uh, RAV4. Uh, the detectives queried PennDOT and got the registrations for all the vehicles of that type in, in the Lehigh Valley, of which there were many. Uh, we ran those registered owners through the Regional Intelligence Investigation Center, and uh, it hit on a woman who owned a Honda CRV uh, and had visited an inmate at Lehigh County Jail. Uh, that moved her from the bottom of a list. I mean, nobody was going to go out and interview a woman who lived in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. Uh, she would have been among the last to be interviewed moved to the top of the list, and it identified the driver who had driven the, the perpetrator of the crime to the scene. Uh, you know, that has nothing to do with, with ALPRs or, or uh, cameras, but the type of technology that is in place that is facilitated by that kind of observation is of immense help to, to law enforcement. One other thought that I had was that, and maybe you're not the right panel to ask the question of, but I mean, couldn't, I would foresee the day that some of these license plate readers could be put on the gantries. The Pennsylvania Turnpike tells us that in two or three years we're going to have gantries all over the the, uh, the roads to basically read every car that gets onto the turnpike uh, and gets off and then sends you a bill based on your license plate. It would seem to me that you know, a nationwide all-points bulletin could be put out for a particular license, uh, a license plate on a car and have every every automatic you know somehow automatically have every gantry in Pennsylvania every toll road would have would be able to report if a particular license plate went past that uh, that camera. I, I, that's certainly feasible with the technology that exists today. And and when de uh, Detective Warg mentioned a bolo, you know that's be on the lookout for. And that's what was used in in the description of the robberies that we apprehended some people for, but. You could put out a bolo using the technology and automatically have those license plate readers uh, give you a hit. Right. Okay. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank it's you. been very helpful, and I think you've given us a whole, whole lot better understanding of the applications uh, that these techno this technology can be put to. Our next testifier is John Yurkonik, who's chairman of the Pennsylvania Online Messengers Association. John, it appears you have some help with you. You can identify yourself and the, uh, and your la the aides. Sure, go ahead. I happen to be in Lehigh County, so I'm going to go back and talk to my 20-year-old son and his friends and make sure they are aware that they are being watched everywhere they go. <laughs> and, uh, the year of careful. Big Brother, right? Yes. So, thank you, Chairman Hennessy and Chairman Carroll and the representatives of the House Transportation Committee. You're welcome. My name is John Yurkonik. I am the co-chair, volunteer co-chair of, of the Pennsylvania Online Messenger Association. And uh, I also am the president of John Yurkonik Agency with 12 offices in six counties, 11 of which are online messengers. I happen to be in Lehigh, Northampton, Berks, Google, Carbon, and Luzerne counties. With me today is Carol Flament and Joe Nacarado, and I'll allow them to, not allow them, they will introduce themselves. My name is Joe Nacarado. I'm the owner of Pennsylvania Auto License Brokers. I've been a messenger for uh, approximately, in the business for approximately 42 years. I have four stores in the mid-state, um, um, Cumberland, Perry, Mifflin, and uh, Lebanon. <laughs> um, and I am uh, co-chair of the Pennsylvania Online Messengers Association. Okay. My name is Carol Flament. I'm the treasurer of the Pennsylvania Online Messenger Association. 
I'm also president of Joe Fita's Instant Auto Plate Service. I have four locations in two counties, Washington and Fayette County. Okay, well, thank you. Welcome. Glad you're all here. Uh, enlighten us on your, from your particular perspective upon the two bills we're considering. Okay. Um, today we're here, uh, as you have our testimony, we're here today in support of House Bill 1509. Um, each of our businesses with over our 100 members contractually partner with PennDOT to deliver vehicle registration and driver's license services in an efficient and customer-friendly manner. I'd like to state that we are very fortunate to have a strong partnership with PennDOT. We work very closely with them on a daily basis, and I consider it a very positive relationship. Some of us, and the three of us here, our businesses have been partnering with PennDOT for over 40 years, and we do have members that have partnered with them for over 50 years. As I said before, our testimony is before you, but I would like to highlight, and I keep thinking I'm running out of this, highlight a few areas uh, of our testimony today, and then obviously be open for questions. Prior legislation eliminated the registration sticker, I believe it was Act 89, on the back of the license plate, and that became effective January 1 of 17. One of the benefits of this action was to save approximately $1.5 million per year uh, per the 2012 Transportation Funding Advisory Committee study performed by Penn State. These funds, it was suggested that these funds that were saved were supposed to purchase uh, ALRP, or I call them auto license plate readers, uh, in the future. And I do not believe that those funds were ever allocated for that purpose. Um, that TFAC report, or the Transportation Funding Advisory Committee report by Penn State University, I'd like to just point out a, a, a point or two uh, from that report, because uh, it, it both gave a conclusion that eliminating the sticker was beneficial, but it also warned of risks that were associated with eliminating the sticker. On the bottom of page 13 of that report, and we can supply the full report to the committee um, if so desired, but it said, um, and it's talking about states, of those states who had considered alternative uh, programs, alternate programs, most of the ones considered still used license plate stickers, just changing the procedures, for example, switching from one bulk production to print on demand. It was talked about uh, inventorying 30 million plates uh, to issue 11 million. Well, that inventory issue can go away. Uh, back to reading. Or from one sticker uh, to two stickers, or from two stickers to one. Uh, only three respondents reported considering dropping the license plate sticker. Minnesota and Oklahoma are looking at window stickers, and Wisconsin is looking at getting rid of registration stickers altogether. The reasons the respondents gave for maintaining their current program include cost, technological issues, current system required by law, and law enforcement reluctance. So that was part of the, that study that was performed prior to Act 89. And then there was also a data analysis and cost benefit calculation within that study. Uh, and that stated, the elimination of registration stickers has the potential to reduce costs of administering Commonwealth vehicle registration programs, but carries with it several risks. From our investigation, again, this is the Penn State study, from our investigation, these risks seem to arise from two sources. First, the lack of obvious signals of proper vehicle registration might provide incentives for motor vehicle owners to avoid registering their vehicles, thus causing a loss of a loss in registration revenue to the Commonwealth. Second, under current law, the lack of a registration sticker provides law enforcement officers the grounds to engage in vehicle stops, i.e. probable cause, which in turn creates an additional means to potentially search suspicious vehicles, thus the elimination of stickers shuts off potentially effective methods of crime prevention and detection. These factors embody real cost to the Commonwealth and the benefits of sticker elimination must be weighed against those costs. It is therefore necessary to estimate the effect of sticker elimination on various indicators. And I'm just gonna interpret meaning just beyond cost. I brought up a bunch of papers, so sorry. Get back to my spot. Okay. Um, our association provided information prior to January 1 of 2017 before the sticker went away, and uh, I believe I testified before this committee back then. 
uh, or probably around 15 or 16 year, that we predicted vehicles would either intentionally or unintentionally lapse registration without the registration sticker on the license plate. No statistical information at that point. We based our uh, prediction on historical data or historical facts. Um, if, for those who remember, there used to be a T tag, a red sticker on a plate way back when. That T tag had fraud and uh, risk associated with it, and PennDOT wisely, uh, back around 2000, eliminated the T sticker. And it, reading from an excerpt from a March 2000 driver and vehicle services update, which is put out by the department, it says, um, uh, they expected to significantly reduce fraud associated with motorists driving with expired T-stickers, evading registration, and avoiding inspection and insurance requirements. Based on the experience of other states, the overall license plate reissuance project is expected to increase registration by 4 to 5 percent. Bump up. The new temporary registration permit is just one of the more steps, and it talks about the way they did permitting on the rear windshield back then, and the gentleman from Philadelphia is not here, but it, one of those issues was there. So statistically, the year after they did away with the red T tag, registered vehicles went up 466,000 approximately, which is one of the largest increases in any year. So it brought people back into the system. Back to current stuff. From 2010 through 2016, Pennsylvania grew the number of registered vehicles by approximately, we averaged it out, 115,000 vehicles per year. That's averaged over those years. <clears throat> From 2016 to 2017, the number of registered vehicles dropped 234,000. Now if you take, and by the way, 2017 is the year the sticker went away. If you take the average 115,000 increase per year, minus 234,000, that's approximately 350,000 vehicles that were not registered in 2017. Is it all to blame on the lack of the sticker? No. Does it have a significant impact? Yes. And it's funny, you can take numbers and spin them and twist them. I'm a numbers junkie, by the way, so I love numbers. But so we had trend, trend reversed. 2018, a bump back came. So 12 million, 36,000 some odd vehicles. So it went from 11 million, eight something to 12 million. So we recovered about 200,000 of those 350,000. But again, trend would have added an additional 115,000. So what happens in this system without the sticker, we have unintentional people who are lapsing out of the system and we have intentional people that go out of the system. So there's roughly 300,000 vehicles that are gonna play unregistered I'm not saying there's people intentionally doing this, unintentionally also doing it, and that's lost revenue to the state. They're classified as registered vehicles. <coughs> so on December 31st, the state looks at legally registered vehicles and takes a snapshot, and that's the data we, I should have prefaced, this is data from the Department of Transportation, and I believe it's as of December 31st of every year. I could be wrong on the exact date, but it's a snapshot comparison. So a two-year registration should have zero impact other than the flow of revenue into the department. It's gonna skew one year a little higher, another year a little lower, whatever. That, that should not have a material impact. Okay. Um, so, so we're looking at, yeah, it's gonna bounce back a little bit. People are gonna come in and out of the system without the plate. Um, A solution has been proposed to outfit uh, all law enforcement vehicles with license plate readers. Um, uh, we're not for or against that. We like the privacy discussions, but there are some challenges with that. There's pros and cons. We've heard a lot of it today. Challenges, our data had 18,000 per vehicle. We've heard 12 to 20 as confirmed. Uh, 7,000 plus or minus vehicles in the state could equate to roughly $130 million to fund. So obviously that funding would have to come from somewhere and we've talked about privacy concerns and ongoing costs to manage the data that's collective, collected and then to replace equipment over time. So it's a constant refreshment. Um, uninsured motorists. W what was happening back in uh, the, the 2000 time period, again, the gentleman from Philadelphia is not here, but, and that gentleman's not also, but Philadelphia had an issue. I'm in the insurance business, by the way. That's our number one business. Um, you know, we have 35 people working in the insurance business, so I'm well informed in that area. The Philadelphia market was inundated with uninsured motorists. You get rid of the T-tag, you tighten up some things, 
it forced people into the system to stay in the system. The people that buy a 30-day policy jump in and jump out. It was much more difficult for them to do that. Um, get rid of the T-tag, you put the sticker in the back. Not impossible. There's still people that play that game. So New Jersey, a state that does not have a sticker, still doesn't have a sticker. We looked at their data from around two, was it 2009, 2008 or 9 through 2015 from the Insurance Institute. Their number of uninsured motorists rose from 8% to roughly 14%. Now, is it all related to lack of a sticker? Probably not. But does it have uh, a cause and effect? By the way, uninsured motorists, it's typically a delayed factor. That part of, we're seeing the impact of registered vehicles that drop. The uninsured motorist, we would probably see the appearance of that over the next uh, few years. We've talked about, I've heard in prior testimony about the uh, registration sticker on the license plate as a visual indicator, provides for safety for law enforcement to approach from the year. We've heard the state police reference approaching from the front. Uh, you know, I've talked to law enforcement and they like to approach from the year, the ones I've spoken from the rear, uh, because someone doesn't have a line of sight on them. I'm not a professional when it comes to law enforcement, so I'm not qualified to speak beyond that. Uh, in prior testimony, we talked about stickers being cut, being put on other plates, all factually true from prior years. There are ways to mitigate that going forward. Several states print the actual license plate number on the uh, sticker. That technology is available. Uh, by the way, I didn't go into what we do. We actually, uh, we previously delivered the registration stickers. We inventoried them, uh, which was a pain. I do not want to inventory stickers. We love print on demand. That is a great concept and can be implemented. Um, and we deliver registration cards instantly, so our computers are connected. So the sticker uh, inventory problem should not be an issue we can print on demand. Uh, they're talking about cutting license plates. I think several years ago I read data where we thickened up the license plate so we don't have to, uh, uh, it's harder to cut. Um, talked about fraud with forms. Someone mentioned about handing out a form, I don't remember who it was, that there, I might have been the, the testifier, that there could be fraud in an inspection station filling out a form and delivering it to one of our offices or to the state. Well, today, inspection stations fill out forms on our behalf, provide to the customer, they sign, we know they have their codes, and we bring them in and we process off of those forms. It's done on VIN verification, that's vehicle identification, number verification, it's done on reconstructed vehicle processing. So that process happens today. It's not a new process that would be created for inspection stations uh, to fill out a form and bring to one of our offices or to the state um, to process. So in conclusion, and getting ready for questions, um, I would say that our association uh, advocates for efficient delivery and customer-friendly delivery of PennDOT services. We also advocate for public safety and the safety of law enforcement who uh, maintain our safety. With that, Chairman H Hennessy, I... Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Ladies, all the questions. ladies, do you have anything you want to add to, uh, to the testimony? Um, We're happy to hear from you, having brought you all the way up here. From this whole He's our mouthpiece. <laughs> I'm sorry? We're, we're the power behind the throne. Uh, I see. <laughs> this, all this stuff didn't come from you me. You prefer <laughs> to remain anonymous. So, uh, uh, anybody have any? Yes, Barry? <laughs> Representative Joswiak? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Yurkonik, I, uh, I just want to let the committee be aware of this. So I advocated for the online messengers to be able to issue a sticker on the license plate as it is, as it is today where you can re re get people's renewals. That's part of the process. But what I think the committee needs to know, and, and you can verify this for me, when you collect money in your, in your online messenger business, that's guaranteed money to the state. There's no bounce checks, there's no late payments. It's guaranteed because if it's not guaranteed, if, if something goes wrong, you guys, they put you out of business. So for you to do it for the state, that takes the burden off of them to somewhat and also guarantees them the income. Is that correct? That is correct. So how the process works, we are online messengers, the three of us here. Um, there's different levels of contracting with the state, so our money is guaranteed. I run about $13 million through my business of PennDOT money that is guaranteed. If it bounces, I'm out of business. I am bonded to, I think, two hundred dollars or $250,000. So there's bonding that backs up our funds, and it flows through our accounts. It's good, and it's dependent typically within 48 hours. 
of when we receive it. So we account for it and remit it as do my, as do Carol and Joe, their businesses and hundreds of others. There's also another way to do it where, um, and not many businesses do this, they can take the work in, collect the funds, remit it to the state, state processes, sends it back. The days of that happening with technology, I think are far and few between. I don't know of many full agents is the next level down that, that may perform that way. But yes, guaranteed money. So, ha so thank you for that. But in my opinion, is having the online messengers do this is a very, very good way to issue stickers on demand, no storage, and guaranteeing them under the Commonwealth. Yeah, and, and we reference, we have 100 in our association. We're at the top tier online messengers. We, we perform every function available that PennDOT allows us to do, and we're very thankful for that. Below us, there's full agents. They do vehicle registration, mostly work, are not connected to the state for driver licensing work, so they have different levels of services. When you add that group in, there's thousands of us around the state that could efficiently deliver stickers to um, uh, the citizens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative White. I just think about, uh, you know, the end consumer and the frustration I think people go through when they have to re-register, when it's just the typical, you know, I'm re-registering and I'm making sure my insurance is all correct. Isn't there an automated way where all of that can just take place consistently as long as nothing changes for the, for the consumer? Is that in part some of what you facilitate? on their behalf so when you or, say i'm sorry sorry oh go ahead i didn't under when you say an automated way so yeah so like in other words you get your registration it, you register your vehicle you should only have to do it technically once and then it auto continues unless something changes as long as you make your payment on the registration and your car didn't change and your insurance didn't change everything's the same so it should just continue to flow this way you're not having to actually do it every single time you have to so to enact an automated way if i'm understanding the question correctly insurance would have to be reported to the state annually because that can change or alter the uh, uh, right now inspection is not tied towards it but it would be so that's making sure vehicles would be safe so today you cannot do an automated process based on current law right so I'm just trying to think outside the box here, right? And maybe we can do it that way if what you're telling us is uh, in part facilitated online. So the, the automated way process. today is you would go online to the, either the Internet, mail into the state, come to one of our offices, go to a legislative office, or go to, we call it the ROC. Um, I'm not sure what that stands for, but the ROC, where Kurt and Anita yeah, are our, house, office so center, our friends are. So... Uh, and you can go there. And by the way, I'll state in, in the state of or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I don't know of any other state in the country that offers so many avenues for the citizens to renew a registration or perform uh, PennDOT services. Uh, or yet we still have hundreds of thousands of people who don't do it, right? So well, that, we, we have it now because, uh, hey, I'm in the business and one of my cars went lapsed because of the visual well, indicator on the back. And probably nothing really changed. No, three minutes with three months without registration. And that's what I'm, right. So that's what I'm trying to get at is maybe there's an opportunity for us to change the state law so that things can be automatically taking place. Uh, I you know, I I was wondering if Do, you had any thoughts on that, or maybe there's a way to facilitate it. That's all. Maybe you're. Give me your a little company. time to think on that one. Uh, I have an, uh, one answer to that. Where um, uh, Pennsylvania has a very low comparatively uninsured motorist rate at the present time. Um, I think it's like 7.6 percent. We're one of the five lowest states under insured motorists. And um, I read some statistical information reports on that. They think a lot of that is because PennDOT does, Pennsylvania does, check insurance quite frequently. Other states do not do that. Uh, Florida has a rate of 26.5 percent, I believe. So, uh, so again, it's, it's because Pennsylvania does due diligence and does check that insurance frequently. And Pennsylvania citizens are much more law-abiding law than other states <laughs> in the union. <laughs> you were going to add something. I was just going to say th those uh, points were at registration, you provide proof of insurance at um, inspection, obviously at purchase, and 
trying to think of there's I'm not sure of any other points of providing proof of insurance. Oh, and if you get stopped with um, law enforcement for some reason. Or any kind of renewals, yeah. yeah. Right. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. And our final testifier uh, is Kurt Myers from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. He's Deputy Secretary for Driver and Vehicle Services. So, Kurt, welcome. Well, Mr. Uh, Chair, Chairman Hennessy and Chairman Carroll and the members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I know it's been a long afternoon. Um, I do uh, certainly want to, uh, to speak to both bills. Uh, my testimony I'm submitting, and you can read through that at your leisure, but I would like to highlight a few items that I think are important to the department in PennDOT. Um, first of all, in reference to HB 317, um, we support the concept. We believe it's very important uh, that there be oversight of how license plate reader uh, information is stored, kept, and then ultimately destroyed. One of our main concerns that we outlined uh, in our testimony is the issue with the sell trade language that is in the legislation. And let me give you just a little bit of background in reference to that, because certainly PennDOT, from the standpoint of our information, is always concerned about how the privacy of our customers is being maintained. And when law enforcement through the criminal justice system uses license plate reader technology and a license plate is captured, that license plate in and of itself really serves no purpose for that law enforcement agency until they do one thing, and that's tie it to an individual, tie it to their registration, tie it to their home address, ultimately perhaps tying it to their driver's license. That now becomes the criminal record investigation. And so our only concern with this legislation is ensuring that when we talk about sharing, we share it for law enforcement purposes and not have those records that now have been compiled. We've started with a license plate, but we've compiled the information into a complete record of an individual which has personal identifiable information in it. And that that not be sold or traded in some other format for some other reason that we or you are not aware of as a citizen of the Commonwealth. And so we would really encourage you when you're looking at this language to ensure that that privacy is maintained and that the controls are put in place to ensure that that does not occur. Beyond that, conceptually, as I said, we support the bill. We think it's, it's, uh, it's needed. As you've heard, uh, license plate reader technology has been growing over time. More and more agencies are, are using it, uh, which is the reason for HB 317. We think that's a good thing. We're also encouraged by the fact that people are embracing uh, new and state-of-the-art technology as opposed to old ways of doing things. Um, so with that, I will say that, uh, again, a HB 317 is a good bill. Uh, there are some f fallacies in the, in the bill from the standpoint of concerns that we have. I've identified those. There are a few other items that we would suggest that are in my testimony that we would suggest be, uh, be addressed. With that, I'll move on to HB uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Yes. Um, HB 1509. I have a question for the committee and the audience. Just by a show of hands, if you would. How many people here renew on the Internet the registrations? Just a show of hands, please. Okay. Fair amount. How many people here mail in their registrations and get a registration card back? Depends on which month. Okay. Under this bill, your ability to renew on the Internet, your ability to be able to mail in a registration for renewal will be discontinued. You will no longer be able to do it based upon the wording in this legislation. And what words are they? Well, Pardon? What words are they? We'll focus on them. Okay. Page, call it up page, by page and <clears throat> line, please. Well, this legislation requires that you demonstrate a certificate of inspection before you can register a vehicle. All right? Okay. That's what it says. It says you have to have an inspection. Now, if you have an emissions inspection, you have to have that first, and you have a sticker that goes on the windshield, and then you have a... Uh, inspection, safety inspection, because that always comes after the emissions for counties where there is both inspections. Then 
the, the inspection station is to issue a certificate that then has to be taken to the place of registration where you register the vehicle by showing your inspection certificate and then you are issued a registration sticker that then goes on your license plate which demonstrates both safety inspection and registration. Now, that's problematic in and of itself. Imagine if you want to sell your vehicle, all right? Safety inspection is for the vehicle, correct? The registration stays with the license plates, with the individual. Now I have one sticker, one of which stays with the vehicle and one of which stays with the registration. How is that possible? The, pr the language is problematic in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't recognize, as the state police testified earlier, it doesn't recognize the fact that there is these two different ways from the current registration of vehicles in the current process. And so obviously from our standpoint, that's a concern. Representative White brought up about, well, can't we do things more conveniently? That's exactly why we did away with the registration sticker. You now can go online, you can renew your registration, pay with your credit card and print your registration. How much simpler can we make it? One of the things that I haven't heard today in all the testimony that's gone before me, maybe a couple comments, is what about the customer? We seem here to be dealing in this legislation with 1% of the people in Pennsylvania who potentially are dishonest. Trust me, they were dishonest before there was a, when there was a registration sticker, and they are dishonest when there's not a registration sticker. The real truth of the matter is 99% of our customers are good, honest individuals. They're buying their registrations, they're paying for their registrations, they're paying for their inspections, and they're getting their insurance. Even with all the statistics, and I, and I, and I, I feel it's important that I correct some of the numbers that have been thrown out here, and you know, statistically, and so forth and so on. Kurt, let's, the start way, with, let's start with the vehicle registration number, the decline in registration numbers that we heard more than once, not just from the last panel, but from one of the right. other panels. I, explain to me how, if that's true, and, and if so, it, what's the reason? It, it's easy to pick out a number, Representative Carroll, uh, and then build a case around that one particular number. But I think you have to look at all of the information, not just that. It is true, from 2008 uh, up to the point in 2016, we saw a steady growth in the number of registered vehicles. In my opinion, not surprising. Our data shows that obviously we were coming out of a severe recession, and as confidence came back, people began to buy more cars, registrations were increased. But it's also clear, at some point in time, that has to level off. In 2017, the number did decrease. In fact, it went from uh, 12 million, six, uh, 60,000 vehicles registered to 11 million, 800,000 vehicles registered. Now that's where Mr. Yurkonik stopped, by the way. It's where also um, we heard other numbers where that stopped at that point in time. However, in 2018, when we ran the numbers on December 31st of 2018, the number was back up to 12 million and four. My point here is very simple. It's a point in time Registration numbers change daily. Um, to suggest that somehow or another uh, this is tied to the removal of the sticker, um, I think is, is, is something that uh, is not a full story. And the fact of the matter is, um, you heard additional information that uh, I think the suggestion was by, by Mr. Yurkonik that somehow or another the number of uninsureds had dramatically increased because of the removal of the sticker. Our numbers at PennDOT say 8%. I was happy to hear that uh, one of the other representatives from the online messengers confirmed our numbers, 7.6%. We are, in fact, one of the lowest uninsured states in the country. And we were before there was a sticker, and we are after there's a sticker. Could I? Yes. Yeah, we got... You know, Mike asked you to talk about a particular number, but you were saying other there were other numbers that you. Well, there are. I, I mean, frankly, there, I thought you were on a roll. I was. Well, I, 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 I even interrupted I know, you because I, know, I thought you were going to. You know, I've been spin sitting back this there for two hours. I've just you know I've been listening to a lot of different things, and I, okay. I think there's some clarifications that need to be offered. Um, I will say this as well: uh, the the revenue number um, by PennDOT's own numbers, um, sixteen seventy seventeen 
for the fiscal year 16-17, we had approximately $731 million raised in revenue. And in the fiscal year 17-18, we had $736 million uh, raised based upon registration. So the idea that there was a loss in revenue is just not factually um, accurate. Okay. Um, <laughs> I do want to talk a little bit about some of the people beyond just the, the issues that I talked about in reference to the actual registration. Um, I've, I've, heard, I've heard that uh, there was a comment made earlier that we have, because of this, we now have idle machines sitting back. Um, it's exactly about what the governor has talked about, that go a government that works. You know, we've been able to reduce the time and functioning on our equipment. That is absolutely true. But what we've been able to do, we've been able to use that high-speed equipment now to be able to do snowmobile as well as ATV renewals for DCNR, and we're soon to implement a program with fish and boat. And so we're capitalizing on the high-speed equipment we have because we've been able to become more efficient at PennDOT by removing the sticker. And finally, I would also note that um, we have saved money. $7.1 million since the inception of this program. And we continue to save that money as we move forward. And so we're very, very, very proud of that. Uh, for some unknown reason, even if you accept all the arguments that you've heard earlier on why this bill is a good idea, I don't know why it has language in it to do away with the biennial registration. I'm not sure what that has to do with the sticker, even if you were to bring the sticker back. And so clearly that's a concern. Motor trucking industry. Motor trucking industry loved us doing away with the registration sticker. You know why? Because they travel all over the country with their vehicles. And when they renew their registration, you know what they can do today? They can renew the registration, send it electronically to the truck out in California, and they're done. In the past, they had to uh, find that truck, send the sticker to them, have them put the sticker on the truck. Now, you heard earlier, too, New Jersey doesn't have stickers. New Jersey has not had stickers since uh, about 2005. Connecticut doesn't have stickers. They did away with their stickers in 2010. Quebec does not have stickers. There are, and they did away with their stickers back in 1990, I believe. So there are a number of other states. Ask yourself this, for military personnel who are out of state, this legislation would require those individuals to come back in to register their vehicle. Because again, it requires the responsibility of having a safety inspection before you can register the vehicle. So what this bill does, bottom line, it takes away the customer choice, it takes away the internet, it takes away the mail process, which is highly automated today and very efficient. When have any of you had a problem with your registration when you renewed it? The fact of the matter is it's very efficient. It takes all of those items away and it says that you'll go now, everything has to be tied together. Understanding customers a number of years ago asked this body to do away with tying the registration and the inspection together. And you passed legislation that separated them, said they no longer have to be tied together. Now this legislation brings it all back together again. So now a customer has to put out money for the emissions, for the safety, for the registration, and as Mr. Yukonic noted, outside of the rock, there's only one place to go to have that inspection certificate verified, and that would be back to an online messenger. So now customers are going to be charged for a service they can get on free on the internet as well as uh, through the mail, other than the postage stamp. Those are serious concerns to the department, and that is why we oppose this bill. Again, 1509. Yes, 1509. Okay. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. I, I've seen a couple of hands raised over here. Uh, Barry, go ahead. It's your bill. Why don't you go Thank ahead you, Mr. Chairman. Kurt, thanks for your testimony. I see you're pretty passionate about it. <laughs> so, first I'm passionate of all, about my customers, Barry. So am I. Okay. And I'm passionate about law enforcement and public safety as well. As I am. So, first of all, you're saying that this takes away the internet application. There's no problem with someone taking their receipt, and, we, and in our bill, we, we authorize PennDOT to come up with a certificate of inspection, which is a receipt, not a sticker, 
to issue to that driver of that car, scan it on their computer, and send it into you with their, with their renewal. There's, that does not take that away. They can still do that. Sec, second of all, um, at one time, they did separate the inspection and registration. I'm getting so many complaints from people constantly saying, well, I forgot. My, my registration, I did my registration. I get a notice for that. I didn't get a notice for my inspection. I just forgot about it. This ties them together. So one of the things that you testified was the trucking company likes, likes this. What's the percentage of registrations on trucking companies? What's the total percentage? Yeah. Uh, apportioned uh, vehicles? There's about 75,000 apportioned vehicles in Pennsylvania. So you're, you're like 1%. Yes, re than generating $150 million in revenue a year. That's okay. That's great. But it's still 1% of the driving population is, is may, may not like we're going to have them do their inspection. E employing thousands of people, yes. Well, okay, but still it's 1%. It's not 99% of the population. So, and you also testified that your revenues went up. Was that due to the fee increases on the registration fees? Because my, my, my truck fee went from 50 to 250. There were a lot of factors in relationship to the, the fees. Part of it also was impacted by the number of people who were picking biennial, uh, which is somewhere That's around right. 16 percent. That was so, another well, well, OK, but biennial took out of some of the years money that would have been generated normally had it been a yearly. So we're still in cycle to get used to that cycle of every two years. So there are a lot of factors. There's a lot of factors, but it also, it wasn't that the registrations necessarily were, was recovered. It was because the fees went up and people, and people paid two-year registrations. I'll grant you maybe some people renewed that realized their plates were expired. Maybe they got stopping at a citation. So it's a combination of things, but the sticker on the plate definitely is required, is needed today. I respectfully disagree. Well, I, I understand, and that's why we're talking. Right, I understand. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I had to say on that. You're welcome. Uh, Representative Heffley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you said about the, the revenue going up for the registration, but it was, it was noted that there were more vehicles in that, that were without their registration with, the, with this new system. What was the percentage but, uh, uh, increase, or how many vehicles were not registered. I know you have those figures. No, that was that was an assumption made um, by the representatives, I believe, from the online messengers that simply because the registration number varied on a specific point in time date, that that meant that vehicles were unregistered. But, but we had more. There's so no cause and effect connection there. Did we? Ha we had. You said we had more cars that were sold. No, I said there were more I, cars on the road because we came out of the recession. Well, so I certainly believe. I certainly revenues up, but I mean, so were there more registrations? In the year prior to this enactment, or were there more, there less registrations the year after this reenactment? On that on that point in time of 12116 compared to 12117, there were less vehicles registered. On that same date, on 12118, the number was back up to comparatively to what it was on 12116. Again, there are a lot of factors involved on in why those registration numbers change. But it's a point in time, and we know for a fact we literally do hundreds of transactions. So, you, thousands so you're of trying transactions. to say, so you're saying now that after that one year, two years, now people have have learned that they need to get their vehicles registered under the new system, and we just lost those folks for that <laughs> no, year. No, I don't think we lost. I don't think we lost any anybody. I think that it's a it's an ebb and flow issue. What I am saying is is that there's a small percentage of individuals in the Commonwealth, a very small percentage of people who potentially are dishonest and weren't paying their registrations before the sticker, be, when the sticker was in place and aren't paying it now after the sticker is gone. Yeah, and but that was what we've seen, based upon the legislation that we're talking about with HB 317, that the LPR technology, state-of-the-art technology, is incredibly effective. Yeah, and but, obviously it, but also, been, but also very expensive, which gets me to my next point. Um, the grant program that was structured in 89, how is that grant program up and running to provide mm -hmm. funding for uh, police departments to purchase uh, a grant program. I think it was only like a million dollars, which yeah. doesn't go very far, but uh, how is that grant program, and is that up and running yet? That's another misunderstanding. There was never any grant program that was a, was a tied to Act 89. Um, as you may know, in Act 89, there was the requirement that we would do away with the sticker, stickers three years after the effective date of the, uh, of the sticker. 
and of, of Act 89, which w was, in fact, December 31st, 2016. Um, leading up to 2016, um, there was some discussion in the last year of taking some of the savings from the elimination of the stickers and funding a program, that discussion, um, a grant program, that discussion uh, ca happened with the Secretary of Transportation, um, two members of the Transportation Committee at that time, um, some of whom are not here now, and um, the uh, decision was made um, not to, uh, not to go, go forward with that by uh, individuals um, in the legislature. We had actually, the department, PennDOT, had offered $12.5 million over five years of, of the savings that we would realize to fund uh, that license plate reader technology so that local law enforcement could purchase the technology. Um, that money now has been committed to other programs, but uh, we well, were turned down. All right. Well, I was here at that time. I voted against Act 89. I was under the impression that at that time, however, I did vote against it for numerous reasons. This is one of them. Um, that I, but I, I, was, I thought that program was up and it's something we'll have to look at. But at the end of the day, um, I think the concern I had and that I expressed previously was the cost uh, to our, our local police departments, which are, are struggling now just to provide coverage. Many police departments across the state are disbanding. Um, the state police are having more and more pressures being put on the state police to cover those areas. Uh, and that cost, while it's a, a savings for PennDOT, it makes your life easier. I got to tell you, the wait times at the DMV is still ridiculous. I mean, two hours to, to get a license. I mean, you got, really got to focus on working on that a little bit. But you have a lot of energy. Maybe put you in charge of that. Um, but uh, aside from that, um, I, I think it's just a cost issue uh, to these local uh local governments that we're really pushing back yeah. on. Uh, and, and then at the end of the day, that becomes a public safety hazard. We don't have the police on the road. I, Thank I, you. I, I totally agree with you. And in fact, when we were talking about the grant program uh, back in 2016, one of the things that we did do is we coordinated a discussion with crime and delinquency, since you, you may know that they run a lot of grant programs. And um, they agreed that they would run the grant program. And to your question about bringing the cost down, totally agree with you. Um, first of all, not every vehicle needs license plate reader technology. I mean, an administrative vehicle associated with a police force doesn't need one. But, but with that said, we were hopeful that through uh, crime and delinquency, they would be able to drive down the price by buying, if you will, in bulk, and then spreading those cost savings out amongst those uh, agencies or uh, state agencies, law enforcement agencies that got a discount. So we were hopeful that that would occur. I think those opportunities are certainly still there. Um, but you're right. One police agency by itself buying one piece of equipment. Let's face it. They're probably going to pay close to whatever the retail price is. But I think those prices can be driven down just by volume purchasing. But that takes a coordinated effort. Okay. Martina, go ahead. It sounds as though there was a breakdown of communication between uh, the leadership at PennDOT or or the people who are coordinating this grant program and apparently the legislative members that were previously serving on this transportation committee. Um, but do you think it would behoove us as legislators to make sure that any particular grant program moving forward is as explicitly uh, mentioned in legislation to ensure that the maybe $12.5 million does get allocated towards those programs from well, now on? Well, we certainly would support a grant program. The problem is now is that those monies that were originally uh, cited for this have been committed to other projects. So now the money's not there. So the money would be, have to be found now to, to uh, fund a grant program. Well, how much money did you guys save on the, on the sticker program being removed? S to, to date, approximately $7.1 million. Okay. But again, that money's been committed to other, other programs. What other programs was the money committed to? I'd have to, I'd have to get that information to you. I don't have it specifically off the, off the top of my head. It went yeah, into we, the we'd also like to see the $12.5 million where those monies were committed to as well. Um, but moving forward, do you think that, le that the legislature should make sure that any particular grant program is explicitly written into language. I, this way, it's not confusing in the well, future. We'd, we'd be happy to look at any language that the legislature may put forward to give it consideration. As okay. I said, in general, well, you know, we support a, we would support a, a yeah, grant program. Yeah, because if monies program. aren't being allocated the way the, the expectations were, then I guess it has to be explicitly written in language. That's what we'll do from now on. Well, I think that's a good idea. It, it was a verbal conversa conversation between the yeah. secretary and others in reference to the funding of that grant program, and it was turned down. 
sounds like uh, we have some work cut out for us as legislators to make sure things get done the way we expect. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Kurt, I just have a question for you. How many registered vehicles exist in Pennsylvania today? Today, I don't have the exact number today. The, the, the date, exactly. Well, the, the, the number that I, I quoted earlier that we ran uh, December 31st of 2016 is 12.4 12 million, 40,000. 12 million 40, and the, when you say vehicles, we're talking about automobiles, trucks? Could be. It's automobiles, it's trucks, it's trailers, it's um, uh, every, motorcycles, it's anything. ATVs? Or, is, no, is ATVs and, and uh, snowmobiles, boats wouldn't be under that, no. Okay, I'm just saying we only have a population in Pennsylvania, men, women, and children, at 12.9 million. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And we have 12, what did you say, 12.4 vehicles? 12 million, 40,000, roughly, approximately. So... Yes, there are many people, while there are many people that own one car for one individual, there are also a lot of people out there who have, have more cars than they do necessarily uh, family members. Yeah. Which and, and again, Mr. Prospect. Chairman, that's exactly my point. When you look at the numbers growth from 2008 forward, it's not surprising with a recession that one of the things that goes is that extra vehicle when there's a recession. You no longer have to pay for the registration, no longer have to pay for all those other costs. And then as the recession goes away and improves, you see people start to buy vehicles again. But at some point in time, it needs to level off. It just doesn't, especially because our, our population growth has stayed relatively the same over that same period of time. So there's a point where you hit a saturation point. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate the testimony of all the testifiers today. I think you've taught us a lot uh, from your different perspectives of what, what license plate readers can and can't do and shouldn't do. Uh, and I appreciate all of your, your assistance to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank Seeing you. Seeing no other questions, we are adjourned. Thank you.